Calling this hearing to order. Um, for the record, my name is Kenzie Bach, City Councilor um, for District 8. I'm the chair of the City Council's Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology. Um, I, this is actually a co-chaired hearing, um, so I am uh, sharing it with my colleague, Councilor Lara, who is the um, Councilor for District 6 and also the chair of the Council's Committee on Environmental Justice, Resilience, and Parks. Um, since this is about green stormwater infrastructure and our water infrastructure is sort of a city services thing, but of course the implications of um, how to make it more green are uh, environmental um, and resilience related, we're co-chairing, so excited about that. Um, this hearing is being recorded, it's being live streamed at boston.gov slash city-council-tv and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Fios Channel 964. We'll be taking public testimony at the end of this hearing. If you're interested in testifying here with us in the chamber, um, please sign up on the sheet near the door. Uh, if you're interested in testifying virtually, you can email our staff liaison, um, Megan Kavanaugh, for the link. That's M-E-G-H-A-N dot K-A-V-A-N-A-G-H at boston.gov. Um, you can also send written comments to either committee, so ccc.csit at boston.gov or ccc.ep at boston.gov. Um, and either way, it'll be made part of the record and available to all counselors. So if you're watching this after the fact and you want to send us something in, please email it to one of those accounts. Um, the subject of today's hearing is docket 0965, order for a hearing on increasing green stormwater infrastructure capacity at Boston Water and Sewer in the city of Boston. Um, it was uh, sponsored by me. Um, Kenzie Bach, and then uh, Councillor Braden and Councillor Coletta, um, who will be here shortly. Uh, it was referred to the Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology, and as I said, the Committee on Environmental Justice, Resilience, and Parks jointly on August 10th, 2022. Um, I'm going to start with uh, some opening statements. Um, I, I'm the sponsor, uh, but I'll actually go first to my co chair, Councillor Lara, um, and then we'll go to um, uh, President. Uh, Ed Flynn, who has joined us here from District 2, um, and then come back, uh, and we may have my other co-sponsors there by then. So, um, Councillor Lara. Thank you, Councillor. Um, first, I'd like to thank my colleagues for bringing this in important environmental concern to today's discussion. Um, looking around at the current landscape of our city, state, and the whole world, we are really at a moment where we have to recognize the importance that water has on every facet of our lives, but also the impact that it could possibly have on our neighborhoods. And I think that the city of Boston is constantly looking to be better uh, and to be a leader and to be forward thinking, particularly around issues of environmental justice. And I think that looking at um, the impact and the expense really of gray stormwater infrastructure and uh, the impact that we could have with green stormwater infrastructure and the cost savings for the city but also the environmental justice benefits um, are going to help us not only here on the council but for everybody in the city for years to come. So I'm excited to have this conversation uh, and I again thank Councillor Bach and her co-sponsors for bringing this issue to the floor. Thank you. Great. Thank you Councillor Lara. <laughs> Councillor Flynn? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the sponsors for this important subject, bringing it forward and discussing it, and discussing it with the professional team here at the Boston Water and Sewer Commission, um, and with the Boston Groundwater Trust as well. I've had the opportunity to work with both the Water and Sewer Commission and with the Groundwater Trust over the last six years. I know the critical role they play in our city. I also want to highlight the professional professionalism of, of your team across the city in all neighborhoods of Boston, but you're providing a tremendous service. You're providing a, tr a tremendous um, and professional way of doing a critical, a critical business that really needs to take place, that is taking place, um, whether it's constituent services or quality life issues, neighborhood services, is, neighborhood services, but the Boston Water and Soil Commission, the Boston Ground Groundwater Trust um, is very responsive and very reliable. So I just want to acknowledge both teams for being here and their professional work they do every day, seven days a week. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Flynn. Um, and I just want to say, you know, I think that um, One of the overarching questions that we're asking about all of um, the city's kind of environmental initiatives and commitments uh, is how do we get there from here? Uh, so the city's made a large number, whether we're talking about our zero waste plan, we're talking about you know um, the 
car carbon um, neutral Boston, just like all kinds of things. We've sort of said, these are our targets, this is where we're trying to be, whether it's 2030, 2040, 2050, different years. I think we all know that there is a overall conversation about the need to pull those timelines in as much as possible um, and because we are in a climate crisis. Uh, but aside from the targets and the argument about the target, once you've set the target, the question becomes, how are we gonna get there? Um, and you know, I think that there are lots of ways in which our water and sewer system has, over the last decades, chased some pretty important targets um, and hit them on the sort of gray infrastructure front. So when you think about, um, you know, trying to control for some of the contamination, trying to, you know, uh, Christian uh, Simonelli who's with us is here from the Groundwater Trust. I think we've made huge strides in terms of their partnership with city agencies and lead Boston Water and Sewer leading the way and closing off leaks to preserve our groundwater. I think we have lots of examples of places where we've really, like, we've chased targets um, and succeeded. But I think in terms of which targets we're chasing, really transitioning Boston to more green stormwater installations um, has not uh, been something that we've done at as aggressive a pace as other um, as other cities. Uh, and the more we've kind of looked into, I think, you know, Philadelphia's kind of well ahead of everybody on that, and it has to do with the nature of, of the types of targets they were subjected to, but, um, you know, there's definitely folks who are ahead of us there, and, and in Boston, I never like to have anybody ahead of us. Um, and I also think, you know, realistically, we've, we've had resource constraints on what we're chasing, but I think we all have to swim now in the same direction, saying, how do we make the city greener thinking about the stormwater system and thinking about how we get more of that water into the ground um, specifically, so not, not just contained um, and preventing flooding, but, but back into the ground. Um, and of course, because of the groundwater concerns in much of my district, which is sitting on pilings, there's kind of a double environmental and kind of building preservation concern um, for, for my angle. Um, but, you know, I just, I think that we've done a lot to assess green stormwater infrastructure for the city. We've got plans, um, but the ratio, the rate at which we're actually putting in green stormwater um, installations is behind New York, Philadelphia, Seattle, et cetera. Um, so I'm really excited. I've been excited by some of the recent um, announcements and uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Kate England in a moment um, and the mayor's kind of focus on this, but I think it, it behooves the city um, services and, and innovation technology committee to really understand the, the challenges and the opportunities that face us and, and how we can accelerate that pace and how we can all work together on that front. Um, before I go to our administration panel, um, I wanna give my colleague and co-sponsor, um, Councillor Liz Braden, a moment to speak on this as well. Thank you very much, I apologize. I just <laughs> stuck on Storo Drive. <laughs> One of those mornings, it took me longer than expected to get here. Um, Yes, I'm really excited to, about this hearing today. Um, I, um, I, I feel passionately about the stormwater management and how we can in, empower our residential uh, population to do more in the, in the not only on the institutional level but also, and, but also down at the sort of household level. Um, just personally speaking, we had a, a flooding issue with our basement years ago. Uh, we used to regularly. Uh, At one, one point, we had 18 inches of water in our basement after a big storm. And um, we went to a presentation by the Charles River uh, Watershed Association, and they did talk about rain gardens and swales. And we were in the process of getting estimates for a dry, a dry, um, a dry well in the, in, the, in the backyard. And we said, so well, let's try a rain garden. And we, we basically pipe all the water from all our rainwater goes into the yard, in, into a rain garden in the backyard. And folks from the, the Boston Water and Sewer came and saw it and said, wow, this is interesting, because we don't put any water into the storm drains. Uh, and, and we don't use ho water hose pipes in the summer. It was a bit tough last year with the drought, this year with the drought. but. Um, I really feel that it's, it's an option that we should also be educating and empowering our neighbourhoods, uh, residents, to, to think about doing rain gardens in their yards as a way to um, manage stormwater, but also to reduce our demands on, on our drinkable water in our, in our systems as well. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation, and um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Manager.
Thank Great. You. Thank you so much, Councillor Braden. I mean, I should say that uh, Councillor Coletta, our third co-sponsor, um, is not here yet because she's at the Eversource substation hearing on behalf of the residents of East Boston, so another environmental justice um, concern. So she will be here as soon as uh, she's out of that. Um, and obviously, you know, a, a huge other angle of this is flooding and the projections for um, flooding risks in the city of Boston. Um, Councillor Coletta's district runs along the waterfront. Um, and uh, and that's obviously something that we're very concerned about, this sort of um, idea that 7% of the city could be experiencing stormwater flooding on a regular basis by 2050, and that already our, our drains are only really able to ca carry about 80% of the stormwater capacity. So, you know, we just want to really think about what are, what's the all-hands-on-deck solution to that uh, from a property perspective as well as a, as a green perspective. So. Um, with that, it's my pleasure to welcome our administration panel. Um, so we've got Kate England, who's the Director of Green Infrastructure for the City of Boston. Um, Kate will be joining us virtually. Uh, and then, uh, and um, also here uh, supporting Kate, uh, but in the audience is Nayeli Rodriguez, the Program Director um, for the Mayor's Office of Newer Mechanics, who's been working on a bunch of um, these green uh, stormwater infrastructure uh, initiatives from the Monum side. Um, as I mentioned before, we've got Christian Simonelli, the Executive Director for the Boston Groundwater Trust, um, and then John Sullivan, uh, well known to many of us, the Chief Engineer uh, for Boston Water and Sewer Commission. Uh, so we're thrilled to have all the key stakeholders from the city perspective here in the room. Um, and we'll start out with uh, Kate England. Great. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, apologies that I could not be there in person. I'm really sad to be um, not, not with everybody. Uh, so. I suppose I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, what the city of Boston is currently doing around green infrastructure, around green infrastructure implementation. Um, back in July of this year, uh, the mayor appointed uh, the first uh, ever green infrastructure director, director of green infrastructure for the city of Boston. Um, and I'm um, very proud to be that person. Um, and I think that the conversation leading up to the appointment was that um, you know, it is important that the city have people, um, you know, in the higher, uh, you know, management levels who are focusing on climate resilience and green infrastructure, um, you know, and environmental justice issues and a variety of other things as their primary, um, you know, responsibility. That that is that is essentially their job. Um, so my uh, position was created uh, in the streets cabinet. Um, and since starting in July, um, we've done a couple of things that we're um, that we're really excited about, and then we obviously have uh, quite a few more things in the works as well. Um, so I want to start by just like uh, talking through a few of the the bigger things that we have done uh, in the last few months, uh, and then um, I look forward to uh, more conversation, and answering questions, and other things as we move through the hearing. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to bring up was um, we started, um, or I guess we formalized um, a green infrastructure working group in the city of Boston. Um, years ago, we had had um, an, a kind of informal version of the green infrastructure working group uh, that had, uh, it was like six representatives um, when I first kind of pulled it together. It was individuals from um, uh, Boston Water and Sewer, which is where I worked at the time, um, Public Works. Uh, Boston Transportation, Boston Parks, and Boston Public Schools, um, some of the kind of large uh, city departments that do capital projects that, that own land, that have, um, you know, an interest in managing stormwater um, and also in greening the city. Um, and this kind of new formalized iteration of the working group uh, has over 40 members representing uh, about 20 city departments. Um, and the goal of this kind of new iteration of the working group is to, um, you know, increase collaboration and to um, allow for uh, departments and individuals to share information, um, to talk about what their needs are around green infrastructure. You know, are there specific resources that would make green infrastructure implementation easier for them, um, you know, or for specific departments, uh, you know, we hear a lot that maintenance is a barrier to wanting to install, uh, you know, green vegetated infrastructure. Um, you know, so we kind of we have historically uh, leaned towards gray infrastructure because it's easier to maintain. But you know, by removing maintenance um, as a barrier, is that a way to increase um, green infrastructure implementation across the city? And so far, the answer that I've been getting from everyone is yes. Um, 
So just like really uh, allowing or creating a forum where different city departments can come together, can collaborate, can talk about what we need, um, and then work towards creating those resources and making them available to as many people as possible. Um, so the group also has three subgroups, uh, and those three subgroups, there's a policy subgroup, um, there's a coordination and maintenance subgroup, um, and then there's a details and specifications subgroup. And those three groups um, are, are very focused on those particular issues, um, you know, advancing uh, or, you know, concocting and then <laughs> proposing policy that could help increase green infrastructure implementation across the city, um, you know, coordinating uh, maintenance efforts um, and, and making them available to as many people as possible, um, and then um, also creating standard details and specifications that are kind of uniform across the city, which makes green infrastructure easier to design and implement, um, but then also to ultimately maintain. Um, so that's something that we're really excited about. Um, with the larger group has convened once so far um, in October. We're convening again at the beginning of December. Um, the large group convenes um, bi-monthly. And then the subgroups um, convene uh, every two weeks or so. Um, each group kind of set their own schedules. Um, so lots of uh, face time with individuals from different uh, departments and uh, lots of progress made so far. So looking forward to um, talking more about what they're accomplishing in the future. Um, the next thing is uh, on October 21st, uh, the city passed our first uh, green infrastructure policy. And the policy was primarily focused on uh, green infrastructure, requiring green infrastructure on city projects that have curb extensions or bump outs as part of their design. So um, public works projects, Boston transportation projects, um, others, um, even parks and others who um, have uh, plans to extend uh, curbs to either shorten pedestrian crossings or to uh, slow traffic on streets. Um, or for whatever the reason, um, rather than paving the area within the new bumped out curb, which had been our practice previously, um, project managers, consultants, and others now have to choose from one of five green infrastructure design alternatives. Um, and those um, include uh, right-of-way bioretentions, so like bioswales and rain gardens, um, uh, porous paving materials, so like porous asphalts, um, pavers, porous concretes, um, infiltration tree trenches or tree pits. So that's trees that are planted in kind of a subsurface infiltration area. Um, the uh, subsurface infiltration where you like, if there are some areas we understand where you just need the solid um, surface for like mixing zones or other things in the city. So when you absolutely need your, your impermeable surface for some reason, um, there's the option to just infiltrate stormwater under the sidewalk, um, you know, with a stone um, or sand-based structural soil infiltration area. And then last but not least, you can just um, seed it with native species. So, you know, rather than again, just paving it, you have the option to now seed it. Um, the policy also included uh, two maintenance contracts, one for landscape maintenance and one for um, maintenance on forest paving uh, materials, which is great. And those are available to city projects uh, throughout the city. Uh, and then the last piece was we're establishing a volunteer program so that residents uh, can volunteer to adopt uh, a green infrastructure feature in their neighborhood. And the hope is that um, you know, people will feel a sense of pride um, and ownership and um, and really, you know, start to, to look for green infrastructure in their neighborhoods, um, you know, because they're able to participate um, in its in its care. Um, so that's another thing that we're really excited about. Um, we are also working on uh, integrating green infrastructure, and I'm putting that in quotes because we're specifically calling out green infrastructure uh, in city requirements and regulations. So there are a couple of city uh, requirements and regulations that exist right now from various city departments uh, that require infiltration or um, stormwater management, but they don't specifically call out green infrastructure as the as what we're actually aiming for um, as part of these requirements. Um, and so. We've done some research on uh, and, and just had conversations with peer cities across the country to see kind of how they have addressed this, um, you know, how they have rewritten their uh, requirements and regulations to specifically call out green, green vegetated infrastructure, green infrastructure, as opposed to just subsurface infiltration. Um, and we've seen a couple of really wonderful examples. Um, some cities and towns use like decision matrices um, and checklists. Uh, some use uh, green infrastructure hierarchies, um, which essentially like the first tier of features 
um, you know, bioretention, bioswills, rain gardens, that's what we'd like you to use first. Um, if you can't make that work and you have to explain why, then you can use this kind of second tier. Um, and then if you can't make those work, um, you know, and you have to explain why, you know, you can use the third tier. So um, just kind of like making it more clear through the language that we put in our requirements and regulations that green infrastructure is a priority for the city. It is important to us and it is something that we expect to see, um, you know, in as many projects as we can. Um, so we're working with Boston Planning and Development Agency um, around their Article 80 and Smart Utilities requirements, uh, working with the Environment Department um, for their Conservation Commission, um, uh, their ordinances and other things that, um, you know, they currently, again, call it stormwater management, but not specifically green infrastructure. Um, and then also um, have had some initial conversations with Boston Water and Sewer about adding uh, you know, requirements for green infrastructure specifically to their site plan review requirements. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention, um, and then again, I'll, I'll let others um, chime in as well. Um, we're also working on putting together um, a like green infrastructure jobs pipeline. Um, and so one of the things that we, um, we felt was important was uh, we need to start to create or to make the connection between um, you know, green infrastructure as a concept and as something that is important that we need to do in the city and how it translates into green jobs and economic opportunity and development. Um, and so one of the things that we are going to be doing is the city is going to be offering some national green infrastructure certification program trainings. Um, it's a national certification program, as its uh, name uh, describes, that uh, essentially trains individuals in how to construct and maintain green infrastructure. Um, and then there's an exam that is taken at the end and then a certification is issued um, for those who pass the exam. And the goal is by hosting those trainings um, and, and paying for the cost of those trainings, we'll be able to certify um, you know, city staff, um, people who are participating in the volunteer program, um, it, residents from environmental justice communities, um, and, and they'll have this certification that we are hoping to uh, then start requiring as part of our um, maintenance contract solicitations, construction contract solicitations, um, and a variety of other things in the future. But we're also hoping to, um, to do essentially job fairs and connections with all the individuals who go through the program. So um, bringing in uh, existing landscaping companies and companies that do this work, um, connecting them with city uh, jobs, um, you know, so if there are positions in parks or in public works or elsewhere, making sure that they're getting kind of connected to those positions and, and first uh, shot at those. Um, we're also working with um, the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development um, and the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Advancement um, and a few other uh, departments to, um, you know, to allow people to create co-ops um, so that they can essentially be their own, uh, you know, small company that is able to, you know, bid on green infrastructure maintenance contracts, not just for the city, but, you know, for other, um, you know, private uh, institutions and private properties. Um, and again, also just trying to make sure that uh, all people who go through this training are aware of what's available to them after. So that includes connecting them with uh, educational institutions, if they decide they really like this field and they want to, uh, you know, pursue an associate's or even a bachelor's in this uh, in this field, you know, just making sure that they're getting those connections um, and being helped into those programs um, as well. And uh, also, just we are <laughs> doing a couple of training days with the city's uh, Power Core Boston program, um, which I'm really excited about. Um, hopefully, I'll be feeling better um, by next week, which is what I'm supposed to be doing those trainings. Um, but we've also discussed uh, potentially doing a full six month um, power course session that would be focused on green infrastructure um, specifically. So again, that would uh, get a little bit more into um, some of the design, construction, maintenance um, and monitoring components that are really essential to make sure that green infrastructure is um, you know, being installed, but also is um, thriving uh, in our city. So uh, a couple of really cool things that we're excited about. Um, Oh, I forgot to mention too, um, I've, I've, I've also been made a reviewer for the Public Improvements Commission um, or Public Improvement Commission. Um, so I will also be uh, reviewing projects that come through uh, the PIC uh, and making comments, uh, essentially expecting the same from our private property owners as we um, have kind of laid out in the first GI policy, which is, you know, if you're doing curb extensions, bump outs um, and sidewalk projects, then we expect you to 
um, and, you know, integrate one of these uh, five uh, design uh, alternatives that I talked about earlier. So um, some really exciting things that are happening from the city side. There's a lot more going on, um, but I just wanted to kind of highlight a few things that we've made some pretty good progress on um, and just kind of give everybody an idea of, of where, we're, where we're headed. Um, so thank you for your time. Great, thank you so much, um, Kate. Really excited to hear about all those things, and we will get to council questions in a moment. Um, but first, I want to go to an uh, opening statement from uh, Christian Simonelli from the Groundwater Trust. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Christian Simonelli. I'm the executive director of the Groundwater Trust. The trust was established by this council in 1986 to monitor groundwater levels in Boston's filled land neighborhoods where thousands of buildings are supported on wood piles. Many of those buildings will last indefinitely if the wood piles remain submerged below the groundwater table. Um, however, if the groundwater levels drop, the piles can begin to decay and eventually lead to an expensive foundation repair. Today we monitor those groundwater levels through our vast 813 groundwater uh, observation well network. Maintaining groundwater levels is a partnership. Uh, that partnership includes city and state agencies which have committed through the city-state groundwater working group to ultimately maintain and repair underground infrastructure, sewers, tunnels, drains, manholes, etc. in our areas of interest. Replenishing groundwater levels is also a partnership. What we get for rainfall or snow melt is, is ultimately maintaining and replenishing the groundwater table. The Boston Water and Sewer Commission has required thousands of their customers to install groundwater recharge systems, one, to clean the water for pollution prevention, and then two, to comply with the Groundwater Conservation Overlay District, GCOT Article 32 zoning. But what about recharge in the public way? For as far back as I can remember, and this is actually pretty depressing, I've been with the trust since 1999, had a full head of hair at the time too. Um, discussion around recharge in the public way was just that. It was a discussion. Um, most of the time, the primary reason centered around complications uh, due to underground obstructions is why we couldn't put it in. Um, I can attest to this firsthand, having uh, supervised the installation of over 600 observation wells in the public way. Um, also in 2013, we partnered with Public Works and Charles River Watershed Association on a porous alley in the south end. We learned quite a bit, particularly about underground, uh, underground obstructions. Um, as a stakeholder, our role in, there, in that project was to evaluate the effectiveness of the porous alley. And the way that we did that was we installed two groundwater observation wells in the vicinity of the porous alley, and we've been manually and electronically monitoring them for almost 10 years. We've seen a positive but limited impact to area groundwater levels. Quite frankly, we simply need more green infrastructure to have a greater, more widespread impact on the groundwater table. Um, I was actually delighted to hear that Kate England was hired as the inaugural director of green infrastructure. Um, quite frankly, I think you can see from her testimony, you really probably couldn't find anybody more qualified or definitely couldn't find anybody more enthusiastic than Kate is to talk about green infrastructure. Um, she's really passionate about it, obviously, and I think it's certainly the right person for the job. Um, and again, as Kate mentioned, I was even more delighted on the 21st of October when Mayor Wu announced a new policy for stormwater mitigation. Um, finally, there's a policy in place with a qualified person to oversee it. Um, in closing, our organization is willing and eager to help, really in any way that we can. Kate, as mentioned, she had formed uh, and held meetings of green infrastructure working groups, which we were invited to and participate in. Moving forward, we can assist in other ways as well, um, whether it be evaluating the impact or assessing the maintenance and need for green infrastructure that is, that's installed in the public way. Um, you know, we can use our wells to gauge the effectiveness of these, of these installations. We can have our field engineers go out and see if an area needs to be maintained, cleaned, um, which is again, Kate mentioned, the maintenance is a huge part of this. Um, and also perhaps this may be time to revisit the city state groundwater working group that was established in 2005. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the sole purpose of that group has been for the agencies to maintain and repair the underground infrastructure. Perhaps expanding the purpose of that group to include implementing green infrastructure in the public ways is a possibility. This group could essentially be a testing ground for small and large scale green infrastructure projects in the public way. We could also look to add additional members to the working group um, to appropriately represent the city and state goals for climate resiliency. I look forward to working with the council and all representatives here today uh, on moving this uh, long overdue policy forward in an efficient, productive manner. Uh, I wanna thank you all for your time and I defer back to the chair. Thank you so much, Christian. And thank you for all your work. Um, uh, uh, last but not least on our panel um, is John Sullivan, the Chief Engineer for Boston Water and Sewer Commission. Mr. Sullivan, you have the floor. Good morning. 
Uh, again, my name is John Sullivan. I'm the chief engineer for the Water and Sewer. I've been the chief engineer since 1989 and overseeing most of the construction that we've done uh, for those years. Uh, noticing your chuckle, I've been working for 50 years, so. No, 1989 is just the year that both me and Councillor Lara were born, so. <laughs> and I consider it a good year also, <laughs> The, um, I, a couple of things I want to uh, bring up to make sure we all understand it. We were, Boston Water School was formed in 1977, I actually started working as a commission, separate commission in 1978. And we were formed because of the disrepair of the water and sewer systems. 50% uh, of our water, drinking water we bought was going unnoticed. We didn't know where it was at the time. Um, on, this, on the sewers, we were having overflows daily, 14 million gallons a day of raw sewage going underneath the New England Aquarium on a daily basis. So it was that purpose that we were set aside from the city. We, were, we have no uh, relationships with the city as far as budgetary concerns go. We're totally separate. We get no money from the city uh, at all. We raise our money from our ratepayers, and we were required to do that beginning in 1978, putting together a capital plan, which we do every year, and we send copies over to the councils um, of what we plan to do. We coordinate with all the city departments, all the state departments, uh, to make sure that we don't interrupt the public. Uh, another thing that's important to know uh, about the commission, unlike Philadelphia and many of the other cities we talk about that are doing the green infrastructure, they're doing it for different purpose than what we're doing it for. We all had combined sewer overflows. Combined sewers are pipes that both the rainwater and the sewage is carried into, and when there's too much rain, they overflow, and they overflow into our water bodies. Boston Water and Sewer, along with the MWRA, undertook a CSO long-term control plan over the past 25 years, and we've completed it. It was about a billion dollars it cost to do it. A lot of the work we did was by separating these combined sewers. We did a lot of work in Jamaica Plain, a lot of work in Dorchester. Uh, in South Boston on the beaches, we have tunnels built to capture this water so it doesn't get on the beach. What Philadelphia and several of the other cities, the major ones that you see doing the work, including New York, are doing is they approaching CSO control differently than we did. We did it by pipes, and uh, Council Bach properly mentioned that it was big gray infrastructure. They're doing it by building green infrastructure to capture the water so it doesn't get in the pipe. But you can capture only so much water. And the thing we're looking at is the long term, it's, it's raining harder, it's raining more. And we need to worry about two things. One thing is the uh, quality of the water, but also the ability not to flood people. So this is something that the commission took a different tact on. So in, in Philadelphia's case, their option is you can see all the great controls in our case we're buried, most of our controls. In, um, in 2012, we entered into a consent decree with the Department of Justice and CLF because we had illegal sewer connections tied into the drains. Raw sewage was going into our storm drainage and into the Charles River and into Boston Harbor. Um, they believed we weren't fixing it fast enough under the Clean Water Act. Uh, so we entered into a consent decree and a couple of things came up on that. We continue to remove all the illegal connections. We do that at our cost. These are homeowners that were built many, many years ago, tied in. Um, but you gotta remember, up till 1968, we were pumping the raw sewage from downtown Boston out of Moon Island untreated. So that's not that long ago either. So we, we went ahead and we agreed with the cleaning up of the illegal connections. We also agreed that in the Charles River area, we would work using BMPs, uh, best management practices, to eliminate phosphorus. What that is, is when phosphorus is airborne mostly, but it also comes from tires and other problems. It did come from fertilizer, but that's mostly stopped. Too much phosphorus was getting in the Charles River, causing the uh, large algae outblooms on the Charles. And we were required and agreed that over 30 years, we would reduce by 62% the amount of phosphorus coming from the city, getting into the Charles River. We've done a lot of work on that. Um, and part of doing that work, we require that everybody with new construction capture the water on their property on, from impervious areas, put it into the ground, so it also helps the groundwater. But the infiltration chambers we require them to build work extremely well for controlling the phosphorus. It's a very effective. It's nature doing what it normally did in the little gullies. We did not require, and we have been speaking with um, the city, 
about encouraging people to do more bioswales. But as if you can imagine how small a lot of our properties are in the city, there's not a lot of room to build large rain gardens. People are trying to put as much housing, affordable housing or other housing, as they can on the property. They have to park the cars. By using these infiltration chambers, you can use all the surface. So we do agree that the idea of green infrastructure is very welcome, and we will be encouraging it when we get the information from the city. Um, but we have been using infiltration because it's a great way of taking care of the pollution problem. And that's a major focus of the Boston Water Sewer, is making sure that the water we deliver to the rivers and the harbor is clean. So we have got stormwater models, we've got BMP models, we've got more models than you could imagine. Um, we, we have tried and true, tested them out, they work well. Um, we are just now embarking on brand new ones, and what we're going to do is take future climate change uh, guesses, the best we can call them, uh, and the impact in the city, and make sure that we were able to avoid flooding in 2050 and 2070. You may have heard about our inundation model, where we worked with Climate Ready Boston, and we're trying to figure out when the uh, tides get high in 2050, how do we get rid of the stormwater? And you will see a report in the next couple of months of our proposals of how we control stormwater when the super tides are here in 2050, 2070. The reason we want to redo our models now is we have inland flooding. Flooding can easily occur inland. We have done studies uh, in the 2015, 2017 range of where can we pocket and park rainwater during heavy storms. For instance, the Island Arboretum has Bussy Brook and Goldsmith Brook, both of them running through them. Large parklands. If there's a way we can control and hold the water in there during a rain event and slowly release it after the rain event, probably within 24 hours, we can avoid major flooding that we did experience in 1996 down at Wentworth Northeast and Museum of Fine Arts. We have already done the preliminary models on this. A very important point you should understand, Boston Water Sewer does not own land in the city of Boston. We own our building over on 980 Harrison and we own a materials handling facility on Alfred Street beside the casino. Other than that, we can't simply park water on someone else's property without them asking us to bring it in. So this is extremely important to understand. We need the collaboration and help of many others, including the city of Austin, uh, PWD. Now we've worked with them for the last 10 years for a lot of green infrastructure work. We were required to do work in Audubon Circle under the consent decree, City Hall Plaza, and Central Square as demonstration projects of what could be done. And you've probably seen all three of them and they work very well. We also worked with the City, um, city of Boston in um, New England Avenue, Codman Square. We have some alleys in Back Street. We've got large infiltration chambers there that were built. All techniques that we wanted to show the city, this is what can work extremely well. Outside our building in 980 Harrison, you don't see it, you see the trees and you've got the signs, but we capture all the rainwater from that street. We put it underground, run it through pipes, and we feed the trees water. So all the water that comes, the first inch of water that comes, goes to feed the trees all the time. 85% um, 80, of all the rainstorms that occur in the city today are one inch and less. So we're able to capture all that water. And it works really well. So we've enjoyed a great relationship with Public Works. They own, and another number that's quite large, 6.5 square miles by our estimate is impervious surface owned by the Public Works Department. Those are the streets and the sidewalks. That is a lot of equivalent rooftops in the city. You should uh, know that right now we have 4,200 infiltration systems built around the city, mostly on private property. And they actually, um, the treated area is 1,100 acres, which is quite a bit. But it's nothing compared to what the city of Boston streets are. And that's where we really need to take a look at next and take care of it. Our job is to take the water from all properties in the city, get it into our pipes, infiltrate what we can, treat what we can, and then discharge it to the rivers. Um, a, another research we were doing was on Talbot Avenue in, um, over by Blue Hill Avenue. We had an old chamber that was falling apart. And we're taking the opportunity for over a million dollars to build a chamber with a type of charcoal, if you can think of activated charcoal, 
where we believe we can remove phosphorus, and we have hired University of Mass in Amherst and Northeastern University to actually study the science of it, to make sure it works. So again, there may be other options for us on a large scale that take care of the pollution. It doesn't take care of the heat island, and it doesn't take care of the, the grass strips that uh, Kate England was speaking about. That's a whole other program that the city will be undertaking. We're looking for pollution control is the big, big power we're looking for. Um, and those that should be built this December through January, and the results should be out in about a year to see how well that works. Again, pollution control is as important as the green infrastructure on all of our streets. So I just wanted to make sure you understood. We will work with the city. We're working with them uh, in all types. We have a manual for the public on our website, all the different types of green infrastructure that work in the city and how effective they are and we're currently designing a maintenance uh, manual. So if you decide in your yard you want a rain garden, we will have a maintenance uh, checklist that'll tell you, make sure you check this off, this, 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 and we'll see how well it all works. Um, and we need to do that because we need to educate the public. A major part of educating the public is we um, built in five city school yards green infrastructure about 10 years ago. We also put together a, a, a curriculum for the teachers to teach this in the same schools. Because it's our children that are gonna be picking up this legacy. That's how be our children that have to make sure that all of this works and is continually funded so we, we maintain it. Um, I would mention that Kate England was working for the Boston Water Sewer Commission while we did that. And that was one of her first jobs. Um, that's, that's about all I have. Oh, one final one. I wanna tell you, commend the Boston Parks Department. They are unbelievable for embracing green infrastructure. We're working with them now on Daisy Field. Um, that's over in Jamaica Plain, where 75 acres of water comes down to one pipe. We have a scheme to build green infrastructure there, do some public education there, and they will rebuild the field there. But in all the other work they do, one of the easiest jobs I have is when we sign all the plans for new connections to our system, Parks Department, home run every time, they take care of everything. So they're a good example of what's going on in the city, what city can do with its property to clean up the water before they discharge it to us. Great, thank you so much, um, Mr. Sullivan. And thank you to all our panelists. Um, we're gonna go now to questions and I'll defer first to my co-chair, um, Councillor Lara. Oh, um, well, I think it'll be okay. I'll just recognize that Councillor uh, Gabriela Coletta has joined us from District 1. As mentioned before, she was at the substation hearing before this, but she's the co-sponsor along with me and Councillor Braden. So um, welcome, Councillor Coletta. And uh, we'll do Councillor Lara's questions and then go to my colleagues and I can back clean up. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, and thank you all for um, your presentations and all the information that you've given us today. Do we know, and this might be a question, um, for Director England or for anybody who can answer, which neighborhoods are going to be the most impacted by the flooding in um, the next decade or so? Uh, yeah, so there's uh, there's two kinds of flooding. Um, and so uh, I'll start with kind of localized flooding, mm -hmm. um, and then we can kind of get into coastal flooding uh, so. and how stormwater uh, kind of amplifies the effects of coastal flooding. Um, so we have certain neighborhoods in the city uh, that we are already experiencing kind of localized drainage issues. Um, and John, I know uh, it, it, one of his favorite things to say is, uh, if you know of anywhere where there is flooding, please point it out and we will deal with it. Um, but there are um, parts of Dorchester uh, and Roxbury that already experience um, standing water during large storm events. Um, a lot of this uh, has to do with uh, older infrastructure or undersized infrastructure. Um, and we have talked a little bit about, um, you know, whether we want to approach those uh, flooding issues with, um, you know, gray infrastructure, large projects, or green infrastructure, or some combination of both. And I think the correct answer is some combination of both. Um, we also have uh, localized flooding that occurs um, in the Mattapan uh, neighborhoods and um, 
we also have some that it's hard to, to kind of like get into general neighborhoods, but um, there, there are specific locations within these neighborhoods that are either low lying or have, again, undersized or, or older infrastructure. Um, and so I think the best way to answer this question now that I've started talking about it is to kind of show a visual of it. And that's something that I would be happy to share um, maybe after. Um, I'm, apologies, I should have prepared it in advance. Um, after this meeting, just to, to give people an idea of, of where we're hearing um, feedback from the public that we are, are seeing standing water during large storm events. Um, the commission does have uh, their inundation model that was put together several years ago that shows uh, locations where uh, we anticipate uh, inundation based on uh, increased storm intensity and a variety of other things. Um, and it points out the neighborhoods that I just mentioned, um, as well as sections of East Boston, um, and uh, South Boston as well. Um, and so we can maybe talk a little bit more about that, um, you know, with, when there's more visuals to kind of point to. Um, and then the coastal flooding piece of it, um, all of our coastal communities obviously experience coastal flooding. And the reason that I wanted to bring this up is that the way that we current ma currently manage stormwater is we, um, we have uh, tide gates essentially that are on the edges or ends of our pipes and what the tide gates do is they prevent um, high tides that um, that John was mentioning um, from coming up into uh, our existing infrastructure and then up into um, our neighborhoods. Um, the unfortunate thing that happens when you have large storm events coupled with high tides is that those tide gates are closed and so all of the stormwater that is falling uh, in the city and is trying to get out uh, through those existing pipes are running into a closed tide gate. And so they can't, that stormwater cannot leave the city in the way that the system is, the gray infrastructure system is designed for it to leave the city. And so providing kind of local uh, storage and green infrastructure and a variety of other things will allow the city to be more resilient to um, you know, flood events that are essentially exacerbated by having um, you know high tides and other kind of coastal flooding issues that we anticipate in the next couple of years, um, and and when I say the next couple of years, I mean we are already experiencing uh, you know astronomically high tides, king tides, and a variety of other um, you know again relatively higher than normal tides, um, and we saw in 2016 and 2018 a few major events that happened. Um, where we had high tides coupled with large uh, storms uh, that dropped a lot of precipitation. And as a result, we experienced flooding in the downtown area um, and a few other uh, locations that um, were, were maybe unexpected, um, primarily because of what I just described. Um, so again, storm water that is no longer able to leave, uh, you know, or to discharge to water bodies the way that it is designed to do um, because of either high tides blocking your outfalls or because tide gates have been closed. Um, so. The short answer is, I think all of our neighborhoods are going to be experiencing some pretty extreme flooding. Um, I guess the point that I'd like to kind of make is that some neighborhoods are um, less able to uh, adapt or less able to recover quickly when um, door or damage from um, storms and flooding happens. Um, and so our environmental justice communities, for example, are going to be um, more heavily impacted uh, by localized flooding, by extreme storms. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we'll be looking at from the city side is uh, creating uh, storage capacity and adding green infrastructure in those neighborhoods so that we can give them a better chance um, of, of, you know, kind of recovering quickly, reducing damage and a variety of other things that I think um, green infrastructure has kind of been used for uh, successfully in other cities and towns across the country. Um, so that was a bit more than I probably wanted to provide, um, and I'm happy to allow others to weigh in as well. Um, but yeah, I think that this is going to be a citywide problem um, and that we need to think about this, not just in terms of the physical impacts, but the, um, you know, the ability of a neighborhood to recover after a disaster has occurred. Council, uh, as I mentioned, we are redoing our models to mm -hmm. answer that question okay. exactly. Mm -hmm. We're going to be taking the future projected rainfall and, and all the tides and everything else that comes with it. We have 10 rain gauges in the city that we measure every single rainstorm. Mm -hmm. We measure it down to five minute increments where the standard across the United States is in 15 minutes. We can tell how hot it rains, the intensity, the changes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the other thing we just were approved by our commissioners was uh, to make our sewer system smart. 
And what we're doing is we're putting in um, devices into the sewers so that they can respond to us every time it rains out. They will tell us exactly how high they got and where they were. And we started off with an initial, I, I believe, 500 units. We expected eventually to have almost 2,000 units out there reporting to us how the sewers are interacting. We can use that data with our models to predict where we need to spend money, where we need to hold back money. And so it'll be able to tell you which pipes are being overworked. Yes, which pipes. We, we know the capacity of them. Capacity. And the computer model says, well, it gets full or it gets you know, a little bit higher. But this will tell us when it gets full during the rain event. So we can compare when it's raining. We know where it's raining because the tide uh, rain gauges tell us. And we can tell how high they are. So we, we intend to get this thing and move it forward so that our sewer system responds to us. In addition, we have two major projects going on right now. We are continuing our CSO separation work. In South Boston, we have a $120 million job going on right now in South Boston, taking out ancient infrastructure, putting in new water, putting in new sewers and drains so that we can separate the systems, both from pollution control, but we can put in larger pipes. Uh, we're also in East Boston, we just initiated the design. We're gonna separate the remaining parts of East Boston. Um, it, it all came up, we had some issues at East Eagle Square and when we looked at the system, we could easily go spend another $100 million and separate that ancient infrastructure. And that will be going over the next seven years. Um, everyone will know who we are for the next seven years. <laughs> we'll be putting in the infrastructure. That also drives infrastructure, gas, it drives infrastructure and communications. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. And so, if, if I may, it seems like there may be some, uh, and excuse my pun, some overlap with the wet spots and the hot spots in the city. <laughs> as well, given the environmental justice, like the localized flooding at least, with the environmental justice neighborhoods. And I think one of the things that we know about green stormwater infrastructure is that it not only helps with the stormwater, but depending on what kind of interventions are implemented, they also cool down neighborhoods. And so is there, you know, I, I'm really excited about the green infrastructure policy, uh, but from what I know, it only requires city projects to do this. Are we incentivizing private, um, projects or construction buildings to implement um, green uh, stormwater infrastructure in particularly in neighborhoods that are also heat islands um, like Chinatown that could benefit from you know roof gardens and so on and so forth yeah so one of the great pieces of um, what we're working on right now and the green infrastructure working groups helping out with it as well uh, is making changes to the uh, existing regulations and requirements. And one of the kind of key things that we're trying to accomplish with those changes is to require uh, green vegetated uh, infrastructure as opposed to, uh, you know, just dry wells or injection wells, um, which uh, John mentioned that there were, um, I can't remember uh, the number he, he gave, but thousands and thousands of uh, infiltration features in the city of Boston right now, but very few of them are uh, surficial kind of green vegetated infrastructure features. Um, you know, because what we have seen from the existing requirements as they're written, you know, is that requirement for infiltration, um, you know, or stormwater management, but no specific requirements for, um, you know, green infrastructure with co-benefits. And those co-benefits are going to be so essential to uh, you know, to keeping our communities cooler, to improving air quality, to um, adding green space to neighborhoods that don't have any. Um, you know, uh, there are so many, uh, you know, benefits to having uh, stormwater infrastructure that, that accomplishes the goal of getting stormwater back into the ground or, uh, you know, or at the very least of, of, you know, reducing the burden on the storm drain system that also, again, provide those additional benefits um, for individuals who live in, um, in neighborhoods most in need. So um, you're absolutely correct. The, uh, the green infrastructure side of this will, um, will have lots of benefits in terms of cooling uh, certain neighborhoods that really need it, um, well, cooling all of our neighborhoods, really. But, you know, if there's a real emphasis placed on, uh, you know, installing green infrastructure in neighborhoods that really need it, uh, the co-benefit impacts can be quite huge, or, you know, quite large. Thank you. I'll see the floor. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Councillor Lara. Um, Councillor Braden? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, 
I'm, I'm just curious uh, in terms of um, the projections is really important. Like I think we've underestimated the impact of these extreme weather events. Like they, they, they can drop a lot of rain. And especially if we get one that's a slow moving storm that stays with us for a while. Uh, we, we haven't, we've seen it in other parts of the country and internationally, but we haven't seen it here in Boston where we're, we're anxiously awaiting that moment when it happens. Uh, I'm just wondering about your idea about the ponding of on park space or whatever that we can use to sort of hold, slow down the, the outfall of, of water into the into the into the storm from the storm drains out into the Charles or the into the river system, and then if we have a big storm coming off, come on shore, that the water is not actually able to get into the into the harbour as well. So I'm just thinking, what sort of capacity do we have in the city to have a ponding system in our parks. Like I know, uh, I know you, you're very familiar with the Austin uh, floodplain by <laughs> Charles River, and we're thinking of what, is there a is there a green a, a green supplement as well as just thinking about a huge 72 inch storm drain that's going to dump water into the Charles. Is there ways that we can pond it and slow it down and keep it? You know, I'm just thinking what capacity we have for for ponding or um, other ways to go at it. Right. Well, first we we have to admit that we only are looking at a design storm of a 10-year storm, <clears throat> basically a little under six inches of rain. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anything over that is going to flood. The pipes are not designed. You, you can't build a system big enough for that. Um, but they are fortunately very rare. Um, the largest rain we ever got was in '54 with 11 and a half inches or so of rain over a couple of days, and there was a lot of flooding. But since then, we've made a lot of improvements. Places that are tributary to the Charles were all dependent on the Charles River Dam. If that dam is working, and that is such a large pool, it works very well. We just need to get the water from the neighborhood out to the river. Mm -hmm. The river will take care of itself as long as DCI is operating the dam, and they've done it very well. And there's a study going on now to figure out how to make sure that keeps going. We're looking at um, our biggest uh, drainage area is the Stony Brook, which is a six and a half mile pipe. It runs from the Back Bay Fens, it runs up into High Park. Um, there's a lot of opportunity there for public land to be inundated. It's public land that we don't necessarily own. The Arboretum run by Harvard is owned by Parks. Um, there are all kinds of environmental rules of what you can do and what you can't. So we are looking at, first of all, quantity, can we hold it? The smart sewers would tell us when there's capacity in the system. This, the pipe would actually tell us you can start dumping some water. So we believe there's a lot of work to be done on that. We're going to continue doing that. We're doing the model first. So in two years, we're going to know more about this city and where it floods. Uh, our current model is great on the coast, not so great inland because we didn't study it that deep. Um, people were shocked when Spring Street and West Roxbury got flooded with four feet of water. Um, just an oddball thing, and there's a, there's a solution. But the model didn't show it yeah. because we didn't study it. So we're going to redo the model, relook at these areas uh, for inundation, working with Kate and her crew, talk about what city places can we park water if we need to. And then we've got the environmental uh, rules to get over. Uh, you know, I sit on the CONCOM. I know what we do to people about environmental rules and what you can do and what you can't. And it may be at the end of the day, if we want to live as a city, we may need to change some of these rules for exceptions, that we can, in fact, do that. Mm -hmm. And so we, we're going to continue pushing that. Uh, we'll be coming up with a plan, and we'll be publishing the plan, and then we'll see where it goes from there. I think one of the, you know, given the, the pressures on, uh, just even on a, sort of a, on a sort of a functional basis in the neighborhood, you watch, uh, you watch people paving over their backyards with, with uh, black, hardtop, blacktop. And, and and they're all on the hills, you know, they're on Bigelow Hill and they're in the Anthem over and, and and then you just think, well, we're gonna get a storm a rainstorm and all that water is just gonna come tearing down into the hollows and we're gonna have ponds all over and flooded flooded housing, flooding streets. So is there are you working with um, like what department what are other departments doing to and this might be a question uh, for other um, just to try and, inf and I think enforcement is a weak, a weak link in terms of ins insisting that, okay, you'd like to have parking in your backyard, but let's have a permeable surface rather right, than something right. that just 
I, I think we can, can. I think that's a great idea, and I think it can be controlled through the inspectional services department. You can't do that on your property without a permit from ISD, and that's where we could control it, stop it, take a look at the property, and say, "What are you doing?" If you're adding impervious area, you can't do it. You must do it. Now we only get a hold of people when they need a connection to a water or sewer pipe. If they don't need a new connection for a water or sewer, they bypass us and they go right to ISD and do what they need to do. Mm -hmm. So. That is a great control center uh, at ISD for any changes in pervious surface. Or if somebody wanted to repave, there was a, um, the Harvard Medical Spot over by Hancock Village repaved their entire parking lot over there and for another 20 years, and there was no really green infrastructure. I think they planted a tree. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, but, but what could have been done there, what could have done to hold more water, to additionally put it in the, into the ground, and you got to remember in the summer when the Charles River gets really low in flow, if we've been putting all that spring water into the ground, that's going to continually flow through the summer to the river. Mm -hmm. So that's going to help the health of the river, not just immediately when we don't flash flood it, but it helps it long term because groundwater moves very slowly and it always moves to its water body. Yeah. So it would help it. I think I just sort of want to add on that. Um, you know, the paving and the resurfacing of a lot area. If a, if a proponent in the G card comes to ISD to do that, they're required to put in pervious pavement or groundwater recharge system. So, and ISD is the one that enforces that. So that would be the catch, simply just implemented citywide and not just in the G card. You know, we have a bunch of systems that have been installed. Hey, I want to redo my parking area. I want to put in brick. I want to put in whatever. It needs to have some permeable surface um, in order to you know, in order for them to get their permit. Yeah, I, I think one of the challenges is just have an ISD be able to keep up with it, and then right. uh, enforcement is an issue sure. across all sorts of issues that we talk about in this council, things that we want to improve. It's the enforcement piece is hard, but anyway, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Councillor Braden. Councillor Coletta? Thank you, uh, thank you Madam Chair. Chairs, plural. This is great. Um, I was really, really excited for this hearing, and apologies for being late. Um, and thank you for your presentation and your work. Um, I'm looking at John, uh, Christian, and Kate. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to have a few comment comments with limited questioning, only because I was late, and I've been trying my best to listen in. And I, I, I don't want to be redundant, but um, I think you know I would be remiss just being the representative for East Boston. I would be remiss if I did not bring up the 2018 Bumble Genesis that happened on uh, the coast of the East Boston waterfront where we saw high tides, so it was a blizzard, um, high tides went up and over the platforms that were built on for new developments. But then we also saw the water come underneath and meet each other in addition to the, the storm surge that took place. And there, there's infamous pictures of folks in kayaks that were kayaking down East Boston streets. So I think of that as, as a good example of, of what we want to avoid and why it's so important to invest in green infrastructure. And I know East Boston is an environmental justice community. I just got off this substation call where we were pleading with Eversource to please um, prioritize our health and well-being. And I think this does have a lot to do with the health and well-being of residents in East Boston. Um, a lot of our folks live in sub-dwelling um, units. Right? They see uh, flooding in their basements, but it's where they live. It's where kids live. It's where seniors live. So I think of this investment as an investment in, in our collective future, and it's something that, again, I'm really excited to talk about. Um, I would like to see way more investment to help Kate expand her work uh, quickly, because we are dealing with a climate crisis, and this is something that um, should be at the forefront of our mind. And I do know that um, you know the BBDA already uh, I don't know if they require developers to do this, um, but I have seen in conversations or in scoping sessions where they talk about, and it's largely with, with bigger projects, but they require them to have a stormwater mitigation plan, but a lot of it is those, those dry wells, and it's largely not creative, and it's not innovative, and it's very rare that I see rain gardens or urban farms or anything related to vegetation. So I'm thinking, why can't we do that on a large scale here in the city, um, on our sidewalks, on our streets, and as long as it's ADA accessible. And I do have to um, bring up the fact that I, I went to New York City recently, and what I saw there was absolutely beautiful. 
Um, there were bike lanes that were protected by permeable spaces. Uh, sidewalk blocks were, um, were dug up and there was rain gardens, there were flower beds, and it beautified the community too. It was just gorgeous to walk around the neighborhoods. But there was a disparity I saw, just anecdotally, no offense to my siblings in New York City, there was a disparity of where I saw this. You know, the West Village is a largely affluent neighborhood. It's a white neighborhood. And then we took a long walk, I tried to get my steps in, we took a long walk to the Bronx and it was not seen. So I wanna make sure no matter what, we're avoiding um, tar targeted investments in certain neighborhoods and not the other. So I do, um, you know, I missed Kate's presentation, but I know that this is something that she's working on and um, I do think that I would like to better understand as we move forward in this process how we are being intentional with our investments. I know that we want to leave it up to residents to maybe do their own re-gardens in their backyard, but I would like to prioritize environmental justice communities like East Boston. If I can make that plug for East Boston, that would be great. Um, just looking at my notes here because there, there were a lot. So yeah, just in general, um, I would like to move forward in this conversation just with you know, the best approaches and strategies about what other cities are doing. Um, I love hearing about what's going on underneath our streets. I think that's largely forgotten, so thank you for talking about the gauges and um, the smart sewer systems. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I'm curious about the East Eagle Square construction. And just for me and, and for everybody watching, what do you mean by separating, I think you called it the ancient systems. What does that mean? How long will that take? And how, how are smart um, strategies being implemented there to avoid the flooding that also happened during the 2018 bombogenesis? Right. The sewer system that goes through East Eagle Square and goes along uh, beside the park there, almost near Reversource, um, it's a combined system. And so it carries the sewers, sewer system during a daily basis. And right at the fish company, it dumps into the MWRA and off it goes. Mm -hmm. When it rains out really hard, there's a huge tributary area behind it. Um, the sewer gets overwhelmed, and it was designed to overflow into Chelsea Creek. We're going to be separating that. So when it rains out, the relatively clean stormwater, I use that that way, it doesn't have sewage in it, um, will directly go to the Chelsea Creek, and the sewage will go right to the treatment plant. So that's what the separation will be. Um, this is a great opportunity. Our pipes are very old there. They're the 1870s uh, vintage. Mm -hmm. um, many of them are in great shape. Many of them are not so great. So, and they're built smaller because we never uh, understood back in 1870 that you could build buildings as big as you could. We didn't build as many buildings. We didn't cluster them together like we do now. So you need more capacity in these pipes. So right now we're undergoing the design. That's one of the tailspins of the, of the area. We'll be doing all of it all the way down to um, the Callahan Tunnel entrance. Mm -hmm. So we're separating that whole entire area, which brings up two things. It, it allows us to take care of our infrastructure. The gas company will be in right behind us. So will all the other underground utilities right behind us. The city then has the opportunity to decide how it wants to lay out the streets, where the green infrastructure could be put in so that the water is cleaned before it gets into that storm drain that goes to Chelsea River. So we're the beginning, we're the foundation, we're the backbone of that work. Mm -hmm. And it'll be new infrastructure, better fire protection, and everything with it. And it should take us about seven years to complete it. Um, it's just because when we're there, the, it's exciting. You, you know, for kids that like to watch trucks, that's good. Um, there's dust, dirt, noise, uh, interruptions, detours. A new police station as well. I know new police station. There. So yes, we got to talk about traffic patterns. And EMS. That's a different, yes, I know. a different conversation. <laughs> So no, so we, that brought it to our attention and then we decided and our commissioners thought it was a great idea and we, we have that as a project planned out, so it'll be happening. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I think just in general, as somebody who absolutely loves municipal government, its processes, and, and also project management, understanding the relationship between Boston Water and Sewer, how you're working with Public Works, how you're working with ISD, how you're working with the Groundwater Trust. There, I have seen and witnessed a lot of um, just a lot of breakdown in communication, I think. So as we're moving forward, I'm looking at all three of you, as we're moving forward, I think breaking down that communication, making sure that our, our, um, our back-end systems that are tracking these projects, I think is gonna be super important. Um, and so I, uh, I don't know if we're gonna have a working session on this, but getting a little bit more specific about that, like how you all will interact 
in ensuring that you know, residents won't be looking at long construction delays you know, where they live and expediting this, not just for the climate crisis, but just for the quality of life of residents is, is top of mind for me. Um, but I'll leave it at that, Chair. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, um, Councillor Coletta. Uh, I have lots of comments and questions. I'll try to restrain myself. Um, one is just to say, you know, I'm really excited by some of the um, things you raised, Kate, in terms of, you know, like training the Power Corps folks. I would love to set, see us set up a, a six-month session. I had the chance to go visit Philadelphia and see their many green infrastructure installations owned there by the Water Department, as we discussed. And um, they've done a really great job of when they had to grow that whole vertical from a maintenance perspective, really making sure that they were growing it with local Philadelphia folks um, and uh, getting a lot of black and brown um, uh, Philadelphians into not just jobs, but ultimately leadership of that stack as well. And I just think it's a really inspiring case. And so anything we can do as, as the city moves into having more of this type of stuff and needing more folks, it seems like the, if you don't do anything, what happens is, is that sort of golf course servicing groups from the suburbs kind of grow themselves to try to handle this work. And I think it would be a huge missed opportunity if, as the city of Boston, we grow the maintenance needs on this, that we don't home grow um, the folks who can do that maintenance. Um, and I guess uh, one set of questions I had, um, and maybe, you know, Kate, this might be for you in the first instance, is sort of in terms of that, I also, I like the idea of breaking down those maintenance contracts, making sure that they're available to our smaller um, uh, MBE contractors, et cetera. Um, but in, in terms of like equipment the city should own, uh, you know, one, and I, I know I've said this, I've said this to you and to Christian and John, I can't remember if I've said it to you or not, but like it drives me crazy the idea that there are places where we own stuff publicly and then we don't put in permeable pavers because we're like, we don't own the vacuum cleaners to do this and have the maintenance crews to run them. Not because I don't think the vacuum cleaners are important, but just because to me the obvious solution to that problem is to buy the vacuums and acknowledge that this is going to be a thing we're doing going forward as opposed to saying because we don't own them we can't put them in. Um, and I do have a bit of a concern that I think in, in, in I think historically, and, and um, John I don't know if this is still true, but I do think there have been instances where Boston Water and Sewer has, you know, in your review of plans for people said, no, don't put that permeable thing in because we don't think you're going to maintain it. Um, and I really feel like we have to be past the stage of saying that to people. I think it's got to be, you've got to have a maintenance plan, right? But not kind of um, that we're not going to have that type of stuff going in. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, I guess, on all fronts. Um, so from, from both Kate and John, like what... <clears throat> Um, Kate, what do you think the city needs to acquire? To, what, as we come up to budget season, do we need to be buying vacuum cleaners? Do we need to be thinking about, um, it sounds like in the short term, you're thinking about external folks to do the maintenance contract, but should we be sort of planning to bring that in house? Just how should we think about the needs there? And then I'd love to like hear John, if you guys are shifting on that kind of, not, not and again, it, to me it's very both and. It's not that the infiltration systems underground are not important. But it just feels to me like we've got to have a bit of everything. And of course, you know, in terms of how the, when it actually goes into the ground, the way that the water gets cleaned, I, I do have both the Charles and the Muddy River, the most polluted tributary. So I do worry about our stormwater going untreated into the rivers. Um, and so to me, getting more of it into the ground is a net plus. But I don't know if both of you could speak to that. Maybe Kate, you first. Sure. Um, yeah, so I, the, the short response to your question is um, I think that the city is, is currently discussing the way that we would like to do maintenance on, um, on public green infrastructure in the short, medium, and long term. Um, so I mentioned that one of the green infrastructure working groups, um, or one of the subgroups rather, is the coordination and maintenance group. And that group has been tasked with coming up with their plan for how are we going to maintain green infrastructure in the next, you know, three years, and then how would we like to maintain it, you know, in the four to six or seven year range, and then how would we like to do it long term? And um, the reason that we are doing this kind of assessment and the reason that we're having this conversation is that um, I've, I've seen it done uh, in, in a bunch of different ways in a, in a bunch of different cities. And I don't think that there's any one correct answer. I think that there's what is the best answer for your particular city or town. Um, and so it would be easy for me to say, 
buy the vacuums, you know, let's just, let's just, you know, build the internal capacity and do it. Um, but there's, there's value to discussing with the other city departments who would also be taking on some of this maintenance if they would prefer to do some of this through contracts, maybe with local co-ops and local businesses, um, or if they would um, you know, like to bring on additional staff because just buying the equipment isn't enough. We have to have the staff to run it. Um, so one of the things that I am doing um, that I, well, that I know that I personally am doing is with the NGICP training, um, one of the, the goals is to put operations FTEs in public works um, operations. Um, we've committed to hiring um, a full-time employee this uh, coming budget cycle. Um, and the goal is to have that person um, train and learn how to use um, regenerative air sweepers, which are the vacuum sweepers that are specifically designed for maintenance on porous paving, as well as how to do um, you know, structure cleaning and maintenance and other things um, on some of our more green vegetated um, infrastructure. Um, again, not getting into pipes and other things because that's that's something that I think that we're going to continue to leave to Boston Water and Surrey. They specialize in, in, in pipes and drainage infrastructure. They know how to do that. Um, but, you know, making sure that our, um, you know, inlet structures are clear um, and our, our, you know, debris is being removed from in front of our, uh, our features so that they function as best they can um, in the right of way. So I guess the short answer is yes, we need to talk about building our internal capacity because we are not going to maintain green infrastructure with contracts forever um, or solely with contracts forever. Um, and I think that there's some value to discussing the purchase of some of that equipment now. Um, and then we need to also train up some of our existing staff. Um, and that is not an insurmountable, um, you know, difficult thing to do. It's definitely possible. Um, it's just a matter of getting the buy-in from all the different city departments to agree that that's the path that they want to take in the short term. Um, so uh, if you're if you're able to put in <laughs> money for um, you know, or a plug for purchasing equipment, I, I will never say no to that. Um, but I think there's also a, a FTE backing that has to happen as well and some training. Um, so that's kind of my short, I guess, answer for the maintenance piece. Um, and I think it's just important, and I know that I kind of mentioned this in passing, we are, because we're not on the cutting edge here, because we are a little bit behind other cities, we have a lot of examples to look to. And I think that we need to be um, comfortable with looking at how different cities and towns are, are managing their green infrastructure programs, are doing their maintenance, um, and taking cues from others rather than reinventing the wheel here. Great. Thanks so much. Kate, John? Yeah. Uh, and when we built Central Square, we had porous pavement put in there as one of the trials, and uh, we found it advantageous to hire a company to do it. We've got all kinds of data on how much debris came out. We know how much it cost. And I think the city would do well um, contracting it out until they got a mass such that it's cost effective to buy your own equipment. Because when you buy your own equipment, that's all specialty equipment. And you need someone to maintain it and fix it, et cetera, and drive it and, and all that. But you need enough of it to keep it full time busy. Because everything we do is cost effectiveness, which brings me to the permeable pavement. We, we found we had a problem over in Sydney Street in Dorchester where someone built a, a permeable uh, parking lot. And it was built well and built correctly. And because they didn't maintain it three years later, it was running off water onto a neighbor's property. And um, we were called in, although water running from one property to another is an ISD problem, the word water was in it and it's in our name, so over we went. And we took a look at all that and to regenerate that particular uh, property, you have to dig it all up again. So we did in fact have him put infiltration. The reason is the infiltration is almost foolproof. And I say almost, you need something to get the heavy debris out. But it works, it holds a whole inch of water. Unless somebody is taking care of this permeable pavement and somebody is enforcing it, and that's where we fall down. Who enforces somebody making sure the pervious pavement in someone's backyard, in their driveway, is done every year? Who's gonna call them up and say, show me your receipts? Show, if the guy says, I took my wife's Eureka out there because it doesn't work in the house anymore, and I vacuumed it, um, what does that tell us? So now someone has to go check out this thing and see if it's still working as designed. So we generally have been pushing the other way. Now with the city pushing the whole uh, heat island and everything else, 
and we're more than open to taking all the recommendations of the city, putting them in our requirements. But of course, our requirement is you've got to prove you're taking care of the one inch for pollution control, because that's what we do. That's, a, that's our end of the game here. So I can't think uh, through ISD or someone if we can find the enforcement mechanism, but there's a cost to that also. Yeah, thanks. No, I, I, I hear that. I just think that we have to be moving towards permeable stuff, so we just have to figure out how to, we have to solve for that. Yeah. But and, and I would say, I mean, to me, the super obvious place to start is on the Article 80 side, and I was cheered, Kate, to see that in your list, but to me it shouldn't, um, I, you know, I think Council already is the word incentivized, but to me it should just, we should just jump straight to requirements, and I think with our big projects, the reality is, is that often we're dealing with much larger actors. It's easier to hold them accountable. They are, you know, they're large landlords who might have a bunch of property around the city. And so, you know, looking there, it's, it might be harder to do the, the oversight on somebody's back backyard one parking spot. But if someone is building a whole, you know, parking lot somewhere, although, again, want to do less of that in general. But right. uh, <laughs> well, a fine example of that is is over at the ERC over in, in Alston. Um, they far exceeded our requirements. They're holding over two inches of water. They've got the green infrastructure above, uh, but it's all to their benefit. So it's easy for someone like that, where it benefits you to have a beautiful landscape, a beautiful campus. You take care of the pollution controls. You, you, you're doing everything and you got the money. You can do it. It's when people are trying to stick all this together and the last thought was, what am I gonna do about green infrastructure? What's this? I want efficient heating in my house. I want six inches of uh, foam insulation. I want this. I want a grant counter. Um, and you're making me do what? So that, that is one of the problems we, we see with it. And we try to make sure that the, whatever's put in is the easiest to maintain. And, and that's what we try to do. Um, and and what's the, sorry, I, this is a very brief, but the charcoal thing, where is that installation going in? It's right at Harambi Park. Okay. Um, there, is an, there was an old uh, chamber built so that back in the 30s they could flood Harambi Park so you could ice skate. So they used to be able to shut a gate. And if you take a look right at Talbot Avenue, you'll see this opening where the water used to come down and rained out and we flooded out the park. Well, we're rebuilding the chamber. It's falling down. So we took this advantage to get some science in there and say, what can we do? So we're gonna co collect trash so it doesn't wind up, all the bottles and cans that wind up at the Nature Center, we'll be capturing most of them there. And we can maintain it easy because everything we do, we build to maintenance, everything. So we're gonna be able to collect trash, treat the water, make sure it works. We're also putting in a gate now. So as I talk about parking water in the future, if it's raining real hard, we have the potential that we could shut that gate. Harambi Park would get a boatload of water on a temporary basis in the future, 2050, but we want to build all these things in now as we're doing all these designs. And when we get through, there'll be a report, and uh, we'll make sure you guys get a copy of the report. If this works, if we have places we can't build enough infiltration of that, we are still violating water quality, these underground units could be built on major trunk storm drains where we could divert the water. Yeah, no, it would be great to know. I mean, we've been talking about whether activated charcoal could help with the Muddy River. Um, we're we're and, watching that closely. We, yeah. we, we have an ongoing relationship with... with the Muddy Water Initiative. Yeah, no, obviously we're very... I mean, again, I just... And it is part of the reason that for me, we've really got to do the both and, like, you know, I think if we were doing more both because if we were doing more of the groundwater, you know, straight into the ground, um, green infrastructure projects, then, you, you know, when you're doing those separation and replacement projects, you wouldn't need as wide of a gauge of pipe if we were getting more water, you know, elsewhere. But also just because on, on my end, I do worry about the rivers and, and what we're sending into them. So I just, yeah, it, it really feels, it, this all feels to me like it has to be an integrated thing. And so I guess the, um, the one other thing that I just wanted to, raise and um you know to me the um and and i i have great i have great respect for quasi independent institutions i used to work at the boston housing authority so you know we sort of are in a similar space over there of the mayor appoints the leadership but then um we're sort of doing our own thing we've got our own budget etc um, but of course also we all have to kind of swim in the same direction and uh, you know to me when we talk about that 6.5 square miles of um of public way that the that the 
public works department owns and the kind of stuff that we're going to need to do in the public way. I, I honestly think like it's important that we be straightforward about the fact that the you know there there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done and there are going to be sources of revenue related to water. Like I know that you guys have been thinking for a long time about the stormwater fee and you know whether we're where we're moving on that. I know that you know the EPA is out telling our big actors, our big institutions, a lot of them are in my district like hey you got to step up and do more. Some of them stepping up and doing more and some of the you know just like assessments we do on our big water users I think are going to need to support the work in the public way. So I don't think we can have a parallel track world where everything related to water sort of from a money perspective is doing the gray infrastructure over here at BWSC and the city just needs to pick up figuring out other sources on all the green the green and stuff. I think it's it's an inter it's an interlocked thing. So I just want to kind of put that on the table here. Yeah, we all serve the same residents. Exactly. We understand that. Yeah, and so I think, yeah, that's going to be um, an important piece going forward. Um, I know there's at least one person on Twitter who will be frustrated if I don't ask you about the four-point channel project, so. <laughs> well, the four-point channel, we have multiple channel products, but the, probably talking about our, our proposal for a storm barrier um, in the vicinity of the Northern Avenue Bridge, um, something we, we scoped out several years ago. We have a full analysis of it. Um, it will be released probably by February to the public. Um, if we were to build a storm barrier there during a storm event, we would be able to, at low tide, empty the basin. We could take that 10-year storm event and store it in that open body. Nobody would get flooded. We could store it. We'd also build pumps in it. Storms bigger than that we could pump. If you could think of the mini Charles River Dam, um, there's an opportunity there. We've developed it up to the extremely crude preliminary stages. We will be sharing that with the Army Corps of Engineers who study in the city's plan on Climate Ready Boston right now. We will be sharing that with them uh, right away to see if that works because if we could get the Army Corps excited, this dam would be exactly as the one in Stamford, the one in Providence, Rhode Island, which they have a barrier like that, only used during storms. And um, it, it works. And if we could get the Army Corps to fund 75% of it and operate it, it'd be a double bonus. Um, it, it serves so many of our institutions. Uh, Boston Medical Center wouldn't get flooded. We'd be able to protect the Ted Williams Tunnel, where it goes underneath, South Station and all Amtrak, um, all the highways. We have environmental justice areas. That four-point channel takes water all the way from Nubian Square uh, area. It's just huge. But you will get copies of that also. Um, it's, it's more than just a pipe dream. It's we got to think broader and bigger. We were always looking at mini pump stations and mini this and mini that. Nobody wants them in their neighborhood. And if you have too many of them, they don't work the day you need them because they're sitting there. It's like that emergency generator that you, did, you bought and you didn't pay attention to. It, it yeah. doesn't work the day you need it. So we're, we're looking at using the natural environment, and, and a lot of our things have green in them, We've got one in Dorchester. We've got this gigantic green infra infrastructure at Davenport Creek, uh, all of which you'll, you'll be able to get a hold of uh, in the spring. And we'll be releasing our report to the city, to the Army Corps, and to anybody involved. So the Fort Point Channel is alive and well. We love the idea. I would love to see the Fort Point Channel barrier be the foundation of a new Northern Avenue bridge. And then we could do two things at once. It would look beautiful. And we are willing to collaborate, you know, with the city or whatever department we would need to. Great. Thanks so much. I have one more question, and then I'm going to go to Councillor uh, Louis Jen. I just wonder, um, Kate, if you could speak a little bit. Uh, the one piece I forgot to ask about on the maintenance thing is, uh, you know, I think the idea of a volunteer program and having our folks be able to, you know, raise their hand and say, hey, I'd like to help with green um, infrastructure in my neighborhood is a great one. But I'm also very cognizant, I'm certainly aware that in my district, um, there are both, there are places where green infrastructure has gone in and we, the city, have, you know, made a neighborhood group sign a pretty onerous um, contract to say that they're going to take care of it for us. Um, and, and so there are both like a couple of places in my district where they actually went ahead and signed that. And then there are also places where I think we didn't put the infrastructure in because nobody was willing to sign that. And I think, you know, that to me, again, is not a barrier that we should have for infrastructure going in. And of course, the concern would be also that you'd have more of it than go in in well-resourced neighborhoods. So 
I, I take I, my, the implication, I think, of your discussion of the maintenance contracts and everything is trying to make sure that we don't end up with that dynamic. But I just wondered if you could speak to that a little bit more directly, because I think it's really important for both my committee and Councillor Laura's. Yeah, absolutely. Your, um, your understanding is correct. Um, we had looked through uh, some of the LMIs that were required in the past and, um, you know, who was actually able to commit to them. Um, the agreements, as you mentioned, are, um, are a little scary. Um, they do require uh, who, the, the signatory party to take on the cost of replacement um, if the maintenance is not performed and the feature needs to be uh, reconstructed uh, or, or renovated in some way. Um, and again, that is um, that is scary and is is often um, prohibiting smaller neighborhood groups from getting involved in doing the kind of maintenance that we're talking about. Um, so the discussion around creating this volunteer program was intended to um, allow neighborhood groups and individuals to be involved in doing the maintenance on green infrastructure features in their neighborhoods without having to incur the responsibility of, of ownership or of owning those features, um, which uh, again comes with that burden of replacement um, if something is, is you know, not uh, functioning the way that it was designed or needs to be um, changed. So the current plan for the maintenance program is that um, any, or excuse me, the volunteer program, is that any site that is in the volunteer program is also currently under the maintenance contracts. So the maintenance contractor is also going to perform uh, periodic uh, site visits and maintenance checks and other things so that uh, the features that we're designing and building, um, if for some reason the volunteer um, or volunteers are not able to perform enough maintenance or, uh, you know, if the group that volunteered to adopt it has disbanded or if the person moves away, which are all reasons why we had heard that the LMIs were so necessary is that, you know, volunteer programs frequently see people just kind of not perform the maintenance effectively. Um, was that, you know, even if those features were not getting the appropriate amount of maintenance that they needed, that at the very least they'd be getting those seasonal maintenance visits from a maintenance contractor um, or maybe in the future from city staff members to, um, you know, to do just the, the, the essential maintenance activities that have to be done to keep the features functioning. Um, and that way, you know, our Again, our goal is to remove the barriers to installing more green infrastructure throughout the city. And so the hope is that by allowing neighborhoods to be involved in maintenance, which will beautify these features, um, you know, volunteers will be able to go out and remove litter and weeds and other things that um, primarily affect how attractive a feature is and whether, you know, how people perceive the feature, if they perceive it as being a healthy functioning feature. Um, while still providing maintenance through maintenance contracts to make sure that the features function, um, you know, at a fundamental level. Um, and this, uh, again, this is a common practice that other cities and towns um, have implemented. Um, I have a couple of good friends down in Philadelphia who I've spoken to about their volunteer program. Um, they actually provide grants to their uh, volunteer organizations that come in and do maintenance. And that's something that we may consider in the future, just kind of depending on how the uh, the initial year or so of the program goes. Um, but, you know, I asked them some, you know, kind of pointed questions, which was, did you see people actually performing the maintenance? Like, was this a good experience for you? And the feedback that I received from them was it's actually been really successful. And it's, it's led to more people asking for more green infrastructure. Um, and then I asked, obviously, about was it in specific neighborhoods only or was this kind of a citywide thing? Um, and they actually mentioned that it was largely in neighborhoods that were lacking vegetation. So neighborhoods that were environmental justice communities um, or had been previously kind of clear cut and heavily paved and developed. Um, that's where they were seeing the most requests for green vegetated infrastructure. Um, so I think overall the... The goal here is to, you know, educate the public about what is green infrastructure, why is it important, and let them kind of see this is what a healthy feature looks like and the benefits of it, um, you know, allow people to get involved with caring for those features, um, and then hopefully we'll see a nice uh, uptick in people requesting um, green vegetated infrastructure with co-benefits instead of 
um, you know, again, just doing the kind of subsurface infiltration um, stuff, which again, lots of value, but just not the same kind of co-benefits that we're trying to get from this, this initiative across the city. Great. Thanks so much. That's great to understand the further context. Um, and I said that was my last question, but I have a really quick one for Christian because I feel like I neglected you, Christian, um, and you're so important to my district. So can you just speak to why um, uh, sort of what the benefit for the groundwater trust is to, to, to green and stormwater infrastructure kind of in addition to the gray? Sure. So the green infrastructure for us, I mean, the most important thing I mentioned about replenishing the groundwater table it's not like we can just turn a hose on. The hose is the rainfall and the snow melt. And since the city has so much impervious area, you know, 6.5, I think you said square miles, publicly owned, that water is just cascading and running off and just going right into the storm drains and being taken away. Um, for the longest time, we had advocated for just a, a simple porous strip in the sidewalk between the curb line and the sidewalk right before it hit the gutter just to get it back into the ground. Um, the problem is that John mentioned about frequent storm events and about, and about the intensity. You know, we're seeing that more. We, we just came off one of the driest summers we've ever had, and then we also had the driest summer we ever had in 2016. So the limited amount of rain that we get, we need to capture. So from our perspective, the more water we're getting in the ground and the more that we can capture, the better it's going to be for the water table, the better it's going to be to preserve the pilings. And that's, that's really where we're coming from. And that's why we partnered with the city and Charles River on the porous alley. Um, but the problem is that, again, th everybody was there for the ribbon cutting, but then nobody wanted to maintain it after it was done. Um, it's actually proved to be very effective, despite the fact that it hasn't been maintained. It's held up really well. Um, and I think, again, that's a perfect spot to look and say, this has been in for a decade. This is what it's done. This is what it looks like. We can do more of these now. We know how to put them in. Um, and so the more that we can get it in the alleys and in the sidewalks, uh, you know, the better for it is for us and ultimately the groundwater table. Again, we can't just turn the hose on. The hose is, 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 is the rainfall. Great. Yeah, yeah, no, and I love the idea of using the memorandum of agreement between all the organizations with the Groundwater Trust as a test for doing some more green infrastructure installations. Thank um, you. Count, Councilor uh, Ruthie Louis-Jen at large joined us a while back, and uh, now you have the floor. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Bach. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here and apologize uh, for being uh, for being a bit tardy to this hearing, but want to thank um, the city for being here and uh, and for talking us through these issues. I know. Um, that you know, as a citywide uh, councilor, this is an issue that a lot of our neighborhoods are facing across the city. Um, I think Councilor Bach uplifted Fort Point Channel, um, and uh, the Fort Point Neighborhood Association has really been really at the helm here trying to get the city to, to really deal with flooding in our neighborhoods. Just this past weekend, we saw flooding um, in the Fort Point area, um, and I think it's uh, important that uh, we are investing in uh, green stormwater infrastructure. And also shout out to uh, the Fort Point Waterfront Community Design Group, I think, program. I think that's been like a really great example led by Boston Harbor Now, BPDA, Fort Point Neighborhood Association, Boston Society of Architect Architects, um, architecture that really shows like what it looks like for a community to come together with the city in partnership to design what the waterfront looks like and to take into account um, uh, and take into account the stormwater issues that we're facing. Um, I think I, I heard, uh, John, I, I heard you mention, which uh, which piqued a lot of people's interest when you first mentioned it, regarding building a barrier um, in the Four Point Channel. I was wondering, curious, if there are other uh, other places in the city where we've explored building barriers. I know that uh, at one point folks were discussing at the mouth of the Neponset River. So are there other areas in the city where we've, we've looked at for creating sort of barriers? Yeah, our program will also show a proposed potential barrier at Dorchester Bay where the Dorchester Yacht Club is right along Morrissey Boulevard where the drawbridge is. Our assumption is that Morrissey Boulevard will be raised someday um, and that will become the dam, if you will. And we could use the same body of water at low tide. There's tons of room there. There is a beach there. It's being taken over by the eelgrass slowly, but there is a beach. And environmentally, it would work for us. We'd be able to take the highlands of Dorchester, bypass that little pond of water, and the local low-lying areas could all flow into it. And so that you'll see in the spring when we release our findings. <clears throat> Those are the two easiest ones. There are potential others. Can you... 
Okay, so I guess the first question <coughs> um, in response to that is there was a million dollar study, I think, was that the BPDA and I think it was another city entity, I'm not sure if it was Boston Water and Sewer, but that put a million dollars a million dollars to looking at Morrissey uh, Boulevard redesign. Is that part of what you're talking about? No, we would be taking advantage of that. Um, that's, that's just going to raise the roadway, yep. which will protect it as a dam would, but you still have the drawbridge. The water still can come under there. So we need to do something there. We would propose that we would build a barrier that only during big storm events you would be able to shut, let the water go to low tide, shut this, and you have this big, gigantic natural bowl into which we could put low-lying water for the local neighborhoods. So and, and it's all written out. You'll see it all. But it, it works. But what's clear is on Four Point Channel, and this is something a misconception people have, the city is proposing raising a berm along Four Point Channel. That is needed. The reason is our proposal would only occur during big storm surges. But twice a day, the tide's going to be high, higher than it is today. And if you don't have that berm that the city is proposing, the normal high tides are going to flood the neighborhood. So both things need to occur. And, and we're trying to make that very straightforward to people. The city's idea is good. We're collaborating with them. We're watching everything they're doing. And what we're trying to do is build things collectively. Uh, we have something like 14 outfalls into the Four Point Channel. If we can just take care of it with one facility rather than 14 pump stations, not only will it cost less in capital costs, the maintenance costs go way down. And that's what we're all about is future maintenance because everybody loves to build things. Nobody wants to fund the maintenance of them. Yeah. And that's just, that's a natural. Can you just address some of the potential like uh, challenges that, uh, like that, creating the barrier in Four Point Channel would create? Like, I know that there are folks who are, you know, expressing some concern regarding, like, you know, a, a potential effect on a uh, local community. So if you could just address some of those, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, uh, our proposal, first big challenge is navigable waterway. So we have to have an act of Congress to build it, which is why if the Army Corps built it, that's easy, because they always talk to Congress. That's where they get their funding. Um, so that's a big barrier. Environmentally, it's no big deal because every day the tide comes in, the tide goes out. We would simply let the low tide stay longer and the high tide. So environmentally, it wouldn't be a problem. We're already, already taking a lot of combined sewage out of the area. There's been a concern that you'd be holding all this combined sewage. Mm -hmm. Well, we yeah. do that at high tides today anyway. But we, we are separating South Boston. We are separating um, the third phase of the Nubian Square separation. We're up on Blue Hill Avenue now doing massive separation up there um, to, so that the water quality is much better. Um, but other environmental concerns are every time you touch water, you get the Conservation Commission and all things that go with it. Um, where do we put it? Right now the barrier is set up that we would hook up one end of it to the federal judges and the other end to the Coast Guard building, two federal properties. Perhaps not a good idea, but if it was at Northern Avenue, we got the city on one side and the city on the other side, so perhaps a more friendly group. But there are a host of challenges. Well, we're putting this out there as to everyone to look at it, criticize it, tell us what could be done better, show us how to do it. And as a city, we're moving forward. This isn't just the water and sewer protecting it. We run the pipes. Um, we take what rainfall is given to us, and now we're trying to find ways of, if too much rainfall is given to us and our pipes can't take it, where can we all collectively store it till the storm goes away? And hopefully not in your basement. So this is where we're basically at. Thank you. And I'm not sure, Al Alice Brown, is, is she gonna, she's gonna be on the? I think she's not actually able to join Oh, okay, us today, okay. Well, um, I'm just, and I, I'm sorry if someone asked this question regarding the uh, attending the design workshops. I believe in January, they'll be putting out plans uh, for community feedback about that design work about the design workshop. I was wondering to what extent the Boston Water and Sewer Commission has been involved uh, and participated in that in, in, in the design process. We, we're thoroughly involved. We're in the advisory committee for Boston Harbor now. We, okay. we attend every one of their meetings. Um, there were two sessions on Saturdays that neither, none of us could get to. So we weren't at the charrettes, if you will. Yeah. Um, but every single thing they do, they share with us, and we give them feedback constantly. Great. And then the, the last question I have is, um, is you had mentioned that there's potentially other parts of the city, and, I, and of course there are other pl places that experience flooding, like East Boston, I know Council Collette is here, and to discuss like, what it looks like to really build a, a resilient waterfront. Are there, are there other areas in the city that you think could, could, could be places that we have, uh, are, are able to build barriers? 
So you'd, my, you'd mentioned it, so I'm just curious yeah. to hear. So you. our study, will, uh, East Boston is a proposed barrier, and the only way we can figure we can take care of it, we build a tunnel picking up all our outfalls with one pump station down at the end of Marginal Street. That's one we looked at. Christopher Columbus Park, um, we would put a gigantic tank underneath Christopher Columbus Park, and we would capture all the stormwater and hold it. So these are all the preliminary designs. You'll see there's one of each type there is in the world all around. Um, and again, we're putting it out there. We know that groups like the uh, Boston Society of Civil Engineers, the engineering groups will look at it. Boston Harbor now will look at it. Again, everything we propose is in somebody else's backyard. This is somebody else's property. Everything we're doing mm -hmm. is... So we've got a lot of work ahead of us. What we need to do is have something that works. If we know it'll work, we can all figure out how to make it work, protect our citizens. Thank you, and thank you, Chair. I have no further questions. I also want to thank you, uh, Christian, for being here. Thank you. Thank and you. Kate. Um, thank you so much, Councillor Louis-Jen. Um, we'll do another just quick round for any follow-up questions from councillors and then um, conclude. So, uh, Councillor Lara. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Sullivan, I, there, something that you just said, which you have mentioned a couple of times during your testimony, is about doing things in other people's backyards because the Boston Water and Sewer Company doesn't own any land. Uh, if you did, <laughs> let's say that there was um, land that you owned, what would be the purpose of, like, everything that you're installing is in someone else's backyard, and so would it be beneficial and how um, to have land that you owned in the city, and what would you use it for, for the record? Well, we don't. We, the land we did, we used owned over by UMass, the old pump station. Um, that was given up to UMass for use by them. We don't own land for the sake of owning land, and I suspect now if we own land that we might be making affordable housing built on it more than anything else. Um, so we don't own land. We're all underground. More for the, for the purpose of managing stormwater. Oh, well, the idea is the stormwater, we don't see it being used all the time. These storms, are, we're looking at the really big, big bad storms. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't identified any particular land that we would like to own. Mm -hmm. We are trying to put this out there so people before BPDA or someone else says, hey, here's a great idea of something to do here. If we need it for a pump station, mm -hmm. then we certainly want that to be under consideration when these things come to uh, the different planning agencies. So our idea is to lay everything out, show people what we think will work, where it's needed, where you need to do stuff, mm -hmm. and before anybody does some work, they would come talk to us. Okay, I just wanted to. I just wanted to make sure that the comment about not owning land was was not said in the sense of that you would like to and you don't and you don't currently. We we do not need to own okay, any land. Thank you. <laughs> just making sure. I was like, do you need land? And what was you using for? <laughs> um, okay, thank you. That's incredibly helpful. I think one of the things that is um, sticking out to me during this conversation is about striking the delicate balance between gray stormwater infrastructure and green stormwater infrastructure. It is absolutely necessary that we have gray stormwater infrastructure, um, particularly because of the job that you have, which is to make sure that the water that we're sending back into the river is free and clear of pollutants. And so, um, at least for now, it is very obvious that we can't, we can't go one way or the other because we need the gray stormwater infrastructure to some extent. And so I think that this question is for um, Director England and for you, Mr. Sullivan. What is, how do we strike that balance, right? Because ultimately, at what percentage are, what is the perfect uh, percentage capacity for our pipes, right? Are we looking at saying, this is how much they can get filled. Ideally, this is how we would like it. This is how they would be high functioning. And then what level of green stormwater infrastructure do we need to install in the city to make sure that the, you know, you're, the pipes are not over capacity and that we're not putting it? I know, obviously, ideally, we want to capture the water closest to where it is instead of sending it downstream. But how much can we do for both? And what, what does that look like, ideally, for both of you? Well, it depends what the criteria of the green infrastructure is. If it's set that we want to capture up to an inch of water when it normally rains, because again, that's 80% of our storms, when it rains out five inches, mm -hmm. we're all good for the first hour yeah. when they fill up. Now we have four inches of water to get rid of. That's where the gray's jumping in. Mm -hmm. We believe that the green infrastructure, if the city deploys green infrastructure in all its streets, that will help keep the pollutants from hitting our pipes, which is to our benefit also. Yes. 
We also believe that if we can get large areas like Daisy Field, where we can treat a lot of water in one space and put a lot of money there, that we have just one place to maintain, we don't have to worry about a bunch of little tree plots up the street. Not that they couldn't be built, but there's already a lot of trees there. Um, we think that's the most cost-effective way for us to achieve our requirements under our consent decree. I'm not talking about the city goals. So the city goals has to be what we need and what the city needs. The city has a heat island issue, so there's a balance. So we want to work with the city to figure out how we can get all this put in the ground, what they can do for pollution control, where they can connect to us, how can we clean out the basins that'll take the sand and debris that's on the city street. That is our job, to take the basins. So it's a balance between the two of us. Yeah. Thank you, I appreciate that. Director England, do you have? Yeah, um, so I just, I know that I've mentioned this a couple of times during, um, you know, during the hearing, but there are a lot of cities and towns around the country that have really functional green infrastructure programs that are run by their public utilities. Um, and I, I think it's worth noting that, you know, we've heard a couple of times throughout the hearing that, um, you know, uh, Boston Water and Sewer is doing, uh, they're, they're essentially doing green infrastructure for very different reasons. They've taken different approaches where they've separated their system, whereas other, um, you know, municipalities are um, are installing green infrastructure, and I just I think it's really important that we acknowledge that these cities and towns across the country that have functional systems that do both gray and green, they have full collaboration and buy-in from both the Boston Water and Sewer equivalent and from the city, and all new infrastructure projects that are being done. At, you know, from Philadelphia, from New York, and from others, have green components as a primary piece of their infrastructure design. So it's not something that is being slipped in when it's convenient. It's it's a fundamental tool, piece of infrastructure that is being used when systems are being separated, for example, because water, stormwater specifically, that is no longer in a combined pipe and is no longer going to a stormwater or to a wastewater treatment plant during a small storm, and now is going directly to a water body untreated, needs to have some kind of pretreatment before it gets to the receiving water. And that acknowledgement, that understanding that I think other cities and towns have come to and that Boston, I think, needs to get to in a more real kind of way is that green infrastructure has to be designed as part of all of the separation projects, as part of all of the work that is being done, um, you know, whenever storm drains are updated, whenever pipes are replaced, um, because it results in smaller pipes that need, to, drainage pipes, excuse me, that need to be put in. It results in, you know, additional benefits uh, from a, a water quality standpoint, because green infrastructure is in fact better at pollutant removal than catch basins. So it's really important, I think, that, that, we, that we don't dance around the fact that using green infrastructure as an integrated part of our stormwater management system, not just as a nice thing that, you know, we can put in occasionally in parks or whatever, but as like a real part of how we design our new infrastructure moving forward in the city of Boston, it's going to have... So, I mean, wonderful benefits for water quality. It's going to allow us to reduce cost for sewer and um, storm separation. It has all of these other benefits to Boston Water and Sewer, in addition to all of the co-benefits that I've obviously preached about for the last like two hours. Um, so I just want to like I just wanted to make that point, and um, I, I appreciate you asking this question because I think it's a conversation that maybe we didn't have yet in this hearing, and it kind of needed to happen. Um, so. I, I know that people are going to have opinions about this. John, I see that you also have opinions about this. Um, but I think that it's important that the relationship between Boston Water and Sewer and the city of Boston be more similar to the relationships between public utility commissions and cities in other cities and towns. Um, and I think that there's, there's work to be done there, but I think that well, I'm definitely willing to do it. And I know that others have expressed a desire for this, this moving closer. Um, to, to start happening now and to be 
um, you know, to become like just how we do business uh, in the city. So um, that's, a, again, a lot of words to say, I think that green infrastructure needs to be integrated into all of our new infrastructure design projects, especially for stormwater. Um, and that while there is wonderful benefit to, um, you know, to having our private property owners and our institutions and others, um, you know, do green infrastructure on their own parcels because of regulations and requirements that we have, that Boston Water and Sewer and the city also need to be working in tandem to essentially install as much green infrastructure in the city as possible to create that storage that we need to create those those redundancies so that the city is more resilient, um, you know, to the impacts of those larger storms that we are starting to see with frightening frequency. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and I think one last short uh, comment before we move on and, and less of a question is that I think what we're what we're trying to do here is revert back to the way that nature has already always functioned, right? We built cities and neighborhoods and houses uh, and have prevented the natural kind of like hydrology function from happening. And now we are trying to build the infrastructure that will help us revert back and allow the water to move freely, to irrigate. We, we are trying to be the best stewards to the land that we possibly can. Um, and I, I wanted to mention that because I think that in the vein of changing the relationship between the Boston Water and Sewer Company and the city, and in the vein of really trying to integrate this work, we need to start looking at stormwater as the resource that it is instead of a threat, which I know that it can be, but it's also a resource. And that what we're trying to do is build all the necessary infrastructure so that we can capitalize on that resource um, as much as we possibly can while also lessening the threat that it can be on our neighborhoods, on our cities, and in the flooding. And so um, I, I, I think that if we approach this conversation looking at stormwater as the resource and looking at green stormwater infrastructure <coughs> as the tool that we need to capitalize on this resource that we naturally have, um, we'll get closer to being better stewards of the land, of the water, uh, and really I think that that's going to be key if we're talking about environmental justice in the city of Boston. And so my hope is that we can maneuver the conversation in that direction and I think it'll help us get to where we're trying to go. So thank you all um, and thank you for answering my questions and chair. Thank you so much, Councillor Lara. Um, Councillor Coletta? Any? Um, I just, uh, I think immediately I'll just say that I appreciate I appreciate the, uh, Kate's candor in calling out the fact that there needs to be better collaboration between Boston Water and Sewer and the city of Boston to, to do this work. I agree that green infrastructure must be integrated in the design um, for any new uh, infrastructure projects. And you know, speaking of the opportunities that we have in front of us, we talked about the Eagle Hill project that's, that's gonna be coming up. Um, I did meet with the PIC to discuss the design. Um, I had no idea that there, you were also gonna be a part of this, right? It was gonna be a major project. So I would love to meet with you to discuss this uh, and reevaluate if we are actually integrating uh, green infrastructure. Um, working with Kate to see if it's actually going to do what, what we wanted to do for, for the community. Um, there was clearly a commitment for collaboration on Kate's end. I'm wondering if there's a commitment from Boston Water and Sewer. Well, I'm a little disappointed that Kate may feel we're not collaborating. We, that's all we want to do. We have been working with Public Works for the last 10 years. We have, we have urged the city that, that, that the water rolling off their streets is bad. How can we help you? Where can we hook up? We promised to do all the cleaning of the catch basins. Um, I don't know where else this collaboration has fallen apart. Um, so it's always been our feeling. I'm, I'm certainly going to be discussing this with Kate. Um, one of the key things is the infrastructure we work, they rarely do street work right after us. It takes a couple of years. For instance, we're on Blue Hill Avenue. We know there's going to be changes. There's going to be bike lanes. There's going to be neck downs. There's going to be... We couldn't possibly put in green infrastructure today when we're doing the work because the city's going to come in behind us and change the street line, change the curb lines, change everything. So it doesn't work that closely. When we do our work, it usually takes several years before the city comes in and does the street furniture, if you will. That's when we need to do the green infrastructure. Now, if we can plan this stuff out so perfectly, 
that we do both at the same time, then we should. But I don't see that happening very often. You sometimes see it in very large mass start jobs, but they take five years to do it. So I, I just throw that out. I mean, we, we're not against green infrastructure at all. I, we, we encourage it. We, we, we hope that the streets and, the, and all the ownership is done. Um, we talk to the city about this all the time. So I'm, yeah. I'm, oh. no, I, and I think there was a distinction there. I don't think anybody was saying that you're against it. I just, the question was, will there be better collaboration moving forward? But it sounds like there's a mismatch in workflow, right? On the city, we could obviously be doing better, right? But I would love to see better collaboration and, and echo Kate's comments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Coletta. Councillor Lujan, any, anything? No, I mean, I guess just on that vein, like I, I think there are opportunities now um, for that like deep collaboration to, to happen and for it to, to be in sync, hopefully. Um, I had public works out in the neighborhood recently and um, it, it, you know, it's going to take two to three weeks to like redesign the street, for example, but I, it, it, there's a role for Boston Water and Sewer to come and put in pipelines that I've never been that are just have been in and in, in sewer outages that have just never been put in on the street. There's Plan Mattapan happening around Blue Avenue. I think that's an opportunity to collaborate. What I mentioned earlier about you know making sure that uh, Boston Water and Sewer is at the table for these four point conversations. So I I'm I'm hopeful that there are these opportunities and to to really be deep integration with how the city is thinking about. Um, you know how the city because everything has to be planned in right. advance because of all, it takes so long to get the money to get the project managers to really to get the community buy-in which which needs to happen as well so i think i'm a lot I'm, I'm, I'm a lot more hopeful that with all the planning that it takes it takes five years well then there's no reason for us not to be doing a better job at collaboration given the timeline that it, that it takes for some of these major projects to happen so right and we and like for instance Mattapan, we in fact did collaborate we we disagreed with the green infrastructure they were putting in they were putting in planter boxes not what we thought would be the right thing to take the street flow so we we go back and forth but you said planter boxes uh, uh, planter boxes okay. uh, uh, they you, you put some soil above ground mm -hmm. and you plant a tree in it mm -hmm. Um, so we were looking at a different way of doing it, but collaboration doesn't have to be absolute agreement on everything and singing kumbaya. That, that's not just collaboration. Collaboration means you talk, you discuss, you, you figure out what is best for the city. They have their reasons. They do the snow plow and we don't. So if they have the reason, they have the traffic safety, we don't. So if they have greater reasons, we collaborate, see what we can do, and they own the street. We don't own property. And again, I, I wasn't, I, I, there should, I understand. Yeah, yes. <laughs> there should always be uh, opportunities to like compromise and to yeah. have discussions. But I'm just saying that like the one should know what the other is doing and one should know what the other is doing and try to do it in a way that is about increasing, you know, the benefit to our residents um, and to make sure that we're planning for the future w with green infrastructure, even if there is disagreement about that, um, at least to know that the parties are talking to each other and sort of what the what the planning looks like for for our streets, for green infrastructure, for stormwater. Yeah, everything we do, we do as best we can with others and on behalf of the residents. We all have the same customers whether they're taxpayers or they're ratepayers, they're our customers, and they're, they're, this is our city. So we have to make it work. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lujan. Yeah, and um, I very much agree. You know, I was thinking, and this is the second housing authority reference I'm gonna make today, but um, there was one time where um, we unfortunately had a, a thankfully non-fatal uh, shooting in a housing development. Um, and I was with Billy McGonigal, the administrator at the time, and uh, a police captain called him up and said, Mr. McGonigal, you have a problem in XYZ development. And Billy said, you know, Captain, I think we have a problem. Um, and, and it's a, been a recurring theme in the history of the Housing Authority sort of getting referred to as, as places apart instead of part of the whole city um, that, you know, he was kind of pushing back against there. And I, I think, I think some of some of the dynamic here, right, is, is that it's it's true at some level that the Water and Sewer um, Commission has, you know, it has a phosphorus problem and it has a, a pipe capacity problem, and and that you know, it, and that PWD has a, um, you know, that PWD has a um, 
like heat island problem and that the groundwater trust has a groundwater problem right but but in fact it's all kind of we 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 right like we the city of boston have a phosphorus problem but we also and including in the we the water and sewer commission has the problem of how we're getting more water into the ground in the public way and to me it's almost like it's like the Water and Sewer Commission doesn't own that 6.5 acres, but from my perspective, you might as well, in the sense that they are part of our collective problem to solve together. And that's, and that's really what I was getting at earlier with the resource point. I mean, I think that it's obvious that we want to do all these things. I think that the concern is that, you know, the, the my, my hesitancy is that the create giant catch basins approach of sort of Fort Point and Dorchester and stuff, that's sort of like, it's a very big version of gray infrastructure. It's a place to hold water, right? Um, and to take pipe flows. And I think like, it's clearly like, you know, that kind of thing is clearly a piece of the puzzle. Um, but I, f I feel like the place I want to nudge the commission a little bit is that, you know, it, it feels to me like part of the attraction to we've got a bigger problem, so let's solve it with bigger gray solutions is a little bit what we talked about before with the fact that green solutions involve ongoing maintenance. They involve potentially growing a vertical like Philadelphia did with folks who actually do that kind of work. And that there's a natural like hesitancy on the part of the commission to sort of go in that direction because you've like, you know, it's been easier with gray infrastructure historically to say, this is the capital cost up front and then we can kind of set it and forget it in terms of its, um, in terms of its durability for until it's literally crumbling and then the city will, right, will do another big capital thing to get it rebuilt. But, but I just think that like we need a greener city in, and, and we need more of this water going into the ground instead of pipes and that's gonna mean a shift towards a sort of ongoing maintenance. And the reality is, is there's not gonna like, it can't like to the ratepayers taxpayers distinction like again if we're talking about stormwater fees if we're talking about you know these permits from the EPA for our big actors like money that's about the water system is going to need to go into supporting this public works like related stuff as well and so i guess that's the to me that's the only place where this becomes a conflict right is about is about resource distribution to um councilor lara's point but i i do think that we just have to kind of we have to acknowledge that the the we that's that we're looking to shift in this more green infrastructure and therefore yes maintenance obligation directed way is not just the we of the city of boston but is also in partnership with the water and sewer commission we are not against green infrastructure we don't disagree we will collaborate with all city agencies and i understand your point uh, exactly it's so we continue to move forward to a better, greener city. That's great. And um, yeah, and uh, I'm excited about that. And I'm also excited about that because I think that, you know, as we think about this green infrastructure as infrastructure stuff, like, you know, I think you guys have a, have a real track record of, of delivering effectively on infrastructure. Um, I, there was that flood recently on the Boston Common corner that you guys, uh, oh, it was very scary, but you took care of it very quickly. And so I think, uh, I love the idea of kind of marrying the city department's focus newly on water with your guys' long-term experience of dealing with water and, and how we kind of all pull those threads together. It's, it's exciting to me. Um, all right, I think uh, we have a couple of members of the public. Oh, uh, I, I'd just like to make a comment. Oh, sure, please. absolutely, go ahead. So first of all, thank you for your time. Oh, right? one second, let me just make sure you have your mic on. And yeah. if you can just introduce yourself. Sure, I, I was good. My, my name is Henry Vitale, and I'm the executive director of the Boston Warrant Sioux Commission. I've been there for 31 years. I'm a certified public accountant. I'd like to acknowledge my director of communications, Dolores Randolph, my director of computer, uh, IT, Peter <coughs> Hunt, and my manager of community relations, Eileen Snedeker. So we obviously uh, were very excited about participating uh, in this hearing. Uh, we're obviously well represented by John Sullivan, who uh, we feel is one of the best engineers in the country. I will be remiss if I don't speak up on this matter. Uh, Kate does wonderful work, but I don't agree with what you're saying about the communication. The Boston Warner Sewer Commission works with the city. We're a team. We support Mayor Wu's initiatives. We're fortunate to have Mayor Wu as our mayor. And she has come up with some tremendous 
idea. She has a wonderful platform, and we support that 100%. But where we support all the city departments, we work very closely with, with every single city department. So we work together, we're a team with the city of Boston. So we're not isolated. But let me just clarify the, and you refer to the BHA, and I would like to clarify the Boston Warren Sewer Commission. The Boston Warren Sewer Commission over 40 years ago was part of public works, the Boston, city of Boston public works. We were broken up per enabling act. We were created in 1977 and were autonomous, were separate and distinct from, from the city of Boston. However, that doesn't mean we don't work with the city of Boston. We're a team. We follow what the mayor's initiatives are, particularly this mayor who's done such a wonderful job after one year. And we have our own enabling act and 95% of our revenue comes from water and sewer rates. It, we don't receive any money from the city of Boston other than the water and sewer that they use. And then we pay the city of Boston for permits and paving. So no money from the city of Boston. We take advantage of the, the MWRA loan programs. If there's any money at the state level, we try to take advantage of that, but there's been no money that's been allocated for many years to the Boston Warren Sewer Commission from the Commonwealth of Mass. So we're self-sustaining. We're a triple A rated credit, and a major part of the credit, the major part of that credit is that we're autonomous from the city. That if we have to raise water and sewer rates, we can do so because we're autonomous. That's critical uh, with the rating agencies. And because we're a triple A rated credit with the rating agencies, our debt service is very, very low. Our interest expense, it's like a mortgage. We have the lowest interest expense and out, out of all the utilities in the country. And, and again, we're very different than Philadelphia. Philadelphia, again, they have a different approach, as John Sullivan said, but we're very different. City of Philadelphia, Seattle, they're all part of the city's public works department. So it's a different, it's legally, it's totally different. Again, we have our own enabling act that has created the Boston Warren Sewer Commission, but we're all part of the city of Boston. We have regular senior staff meetings, regular department head meetings, and the, we have multiple goals, but the major goal is what is in the best interest of the ratepayers of the city of Boston. And we answer to a three-member board, and certainly Mayor Wu has been extraordinary as far as supporting what we do with the Boston Warren Sewer Commission. And her team, we, we obviously deal with Tiffany Chu and Mike Firestone and various other individuals who've been just so supportive of, of the Boston Warren Sewer Commission, and we try to always reciprocate in the same fashion. But understand, we're, even though we're separate and distinct, and we are totally different than Philadelphia, totally different than New York and Seattle, we're still a team player. We still, we still work with the city of Boston. The city of Boston and its residents are our priority. So I wanna clear that up when there's the lack of Communication. I don't believe that. And again, I've been there for 31 years. Sure, we, there's issues, but we, we overcome those issues. We always strive to do better. And, and, and that's what we do. And communication is so important. I mean, we, we, we work with the city all the time. And when we have a project, I'm from East Boston. I'm from East Boston. That's where I grew up. I live in Jamaica Plain. I've been living in the city of Boston for 61 years. East, East Boston is a, is a great place, and we always try to do whatever we can in East Boston. Any projects that take place in East Boston, we're, we're talking to Public Works, we're, we're talking to Parks and Rec. This constant dialogue, we share, we share software and information. It's all about the data, analyzing the data and executing, and that's what we do. Sure, it's not perfect, there's been mistakes, but. Our goal is always to work together as a team. And, and again, we do this in every neighborhood. If we have projects going on in the neighborhood, we show up, anything that impacts the water and sewer infrastructure, we're there. We're there at meetings when it doesn't affect the water and sewer infrastructure. And let me also say that you saw what happened in Lowell yesterday, right? Boston Water and Sewer, critical to the city of Boston. We service over 1.2 million people in the city of Boston on a daily basis. 
Over 700,000 people live in the city, take into consideration the people that work, visit, so all the schools, all the hospitals. We're a public health agency. It's all about public health. And the develop, we'll use this as an example, the development of the seaport. And I think we've talked about this, Council Block. There was no way that any of that, that construction would have been developed over at the seaport if we didn't have a clean Boston water and sewer. Uh, Boston Harbor. That's why the Boston, the MWRA, who we buy the water and the treatment of the water from, they were created to clean that Boston Harbor. And the initiative was they spent billions of dollars cleaning the Boston, Boston Harbor and the waterways. For every dollar that they spend at the MWRA, the commission's responsible for 33 cents. So we work closely with the MWRA, and if we did not have a clean Boston Harbor, where we spent all this money, there were, no development would have been made over there. And we factor in that uh, for every dollar that we spend on the city of Boston's water and sewer infrastructure, we get back three dollars, whether it's investments or whether it's taxes. And just to give you a small example, and I'm going to end here because I, I know it's getting late. Uh, we have a, an activity report that we issue to our board on a quarterly basis. It identifies all our activities, and we benchmark it with uh, other water and sewer utilities. We benchmark it with industry standards. One of the industry standards that we, we, we compare is that for 1231, uh, 2022, right up until right now and through the end of the year, we have had 30 water main breaks. A system the size of the Boston Water and Sewer Commission, which is 1,000 water water pipes and 1,500 sewer and drain pipes, we should have 250 water main breaks. That didn't happen by accident. That's all the investment and all the hard work, all the dedication of, of the 500 employees at the Boston Warren Sewer Commission and the administrations and the city of Boston, everybody working together to make sure that we have a strong water and sewer infrastructure. And again, we, the Boston Water and Sewer Commission is there to support the city of Boston. And even though we're separate and distinct legally, we consider ourselves a team player with the city. We're part of the city, we work with the city, and we're always available for the city of Boston because we all live in this wonderful city. So I just wanted to clarify that. And if, if there's any questions, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to answer any questions that you may have. No, thank you so much, um, Chairman Mattali. Thank you for sharing those remarks. And yeah, I don't want there to be any doubt that the council is extremely appreciative of all the work that the Boston Water and Sewer Commission does. And as you say, it's a it's a core public health feature. It's you know, I'm very proud. I always I always say uh, wave off anyone who's trying to drink anything besides tap water when they're with me in the city because um, we've got very high quality stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, and I just I think we all know you guys are you guys do critical infrastructure work on behalf of the city and. Um, you know, I think uh, no nothing about figuring out, you know, how do we best tackle these, you know, frankly, these changes in projections and these new realities that we're all facing together. None of that is to gainsay any of the really excellent work that you and your team do and, and have done for a really long time. So thank you. I mean, look at tap water. Tap water costs you at two cents a gallon and it's regulated by the EPA, which is testing for over 120 contaminants. Water that you buy in the store it's, it's five times that, and it's regulated by the FDA, and it's only testing about 30 contaminants. It's a big difference in the quality of water. So again, uh, y you don't know about the Boston Warren Sewer Commission until like we have a water main break, or if there's a sewer backup, or if there's something significant. But we play a major role in the life of everybody in the city of Boston. And certainly fire protection, so important. Always checking out fire hydrants, working with the fire department, that's another collaboration that we have on a regular basis. So again, thank you for this time. I'm sorry if I, I took up too much of your time, but I felt it was important for the record to at least make these comments, and thank you. No, we're delighted. Thank you so much. Um, all right, I think uh, we're, um, I'm gonna go to public testimony. Um, if, if colleagues all right? Okay, great. So I've got, um, I've got Clifton, uh, right there is great. Um, 
in person, and then we'll go to Steve Hollinger on the Zoom. So, um, and if you do, if you're, I don't think anybody else is here who might be wanting to testify, but if you are, just sign up on the corner and we'll add you to the list. Good afternoon, um, everybody. My name is Clifton Braithwaite, and I promise to be real brief. Um, from my observation um, in the Nubian Square area, if I'm correct, some of that technology with the drainage um, is around that building, correct? Correct. All right. Um, just my observation. Sometimes in theory and practical work doesn't work together. I know of all the businesses that are surrounded by the Bruce Bowling Building have dealt with a lot of wattage, extra water. And a part of it, maintenance is one of the biggest problems with that system. Um, how can we assure that we can put a budget aside just for the maintenance? Because the system itself for the last three years of first being put in has worked tremendously good. But um, the ownership and the people that work in that area and walk in that area have complained about the extra drainage. So how can we find a problem and a solution to help you guys? Because you're doing an excellent job, but maintenance is a main part of that system. That's all I wanted to speak about, the practical work that I see in the community that's not happening. I'm not blaming anybody, but how do we get everybody on the same page so the businesses down there can get the clarity? Because basically it was about sand and dust filtering the filters and causing some type of problems. I know a little bit more, but I don't speak too technically about it. But I just want to know how can we help you as residents of the community and how can we help the system and the city to make sure that the residents and the business owners in the Nubian Square area and other surrounding areas don't deal with the extra water. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Clifton. Um, I'm gonna go to the other public testifier and then if any of our panelists did have a comment on it being great, if not, we will, um, we'll follow up with, a, with an answer um, for Mr. Braithwaite about that uh, as the committee. Um, so let's bring up uh, uh, Stephen, Stephen Hollinger from the F a Four Point resident. He's still here. Joys of hybrid. <laughs> Hello? Hello, we can hear you. We can't okay, see you. Okay, I'm sorry. I had to switch to be a panelist, sorry about that. Um, first of all, I wanna thank the council for today's um, discussion, it's excellent. And I also wanna thank the uh, panelists, I have great regard for Chief Sullivan's work, and also want to thank Director England, who I feel is really leading on so many issues. So first of all, very positive about this panel and, and generally what's going on. But I do want to bring up three areas where I have been raising concerns for at least five years, and these haven't been addressed. And um, I look at cities worldwide. I don't look at cities in the U.S. because I feel the leading cities are really in other countries. I don't see the U.S. leading among world cities in terms of how cities are managing stormwater or, or these issues. So number one, um, I'd like to know what, where district level planning is for stormwater, where the city is broken up into individual districts and then knowable volumes of stormwater that are recognized by um, Boston Water and Sewer. We know we can calculate the volumes of stormwater and then the solutions identified for those individual districts um, then you do a best case analysis on different solutions, whether it's the four point barrier concept, which I do, I really am excited about. But each city, each district citywide is gonna be inundated and it's a huge threat to the city of Boston. It's not something that needs to, should be taken lightly. So I would like to know where district level planning has been at grade. And this I think should have fallen to BPDA, not just Boston Water and Sewer. Also, increasing base level requirements for the capture of stormwater from large project development in the city. The, uh, developers are still capturing, I think, one and a quarter inches or something like that. But the, the, the long-term projections are much, much larger in frequency and volume. And I don't understand why we're still looking at capturing very small volumes of stormwater on site. The remaining over, the overflow will flow into other properties and be someone else's problem downstream. Lastly, funding. Um, I've been asking for at least five years where a value capture mechanism is for funding of mitigation projects from development in, in flood zones to help pay for some of these larger solutions that are going to be needed, rather than looking at everything on a project-by-project -project basis and trying to elevate individual projects. Lastly, I feel personally that Boston would benefit from some independent oversight I, I generally feel the environment's a little too comfortable and cozy where BPDA is collaborating at, with 
advocacy organizations and developers are collaborating with our advocacy organizations and everyone's really happy with each other. But what I, I generally like more friction and I'd like to see more arm's length oversight of what's going on, what's being proposed. I think that's what you're hearing from me today. Um, and I'm not an expert, by the way, so I'll take any kind of criticism or concern. Thanks very much for your time. And again, I appreciate all the work by everyone here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, so if, if any of our panelists have any comments on, on um, Steve or Clifton's comments, happy to take them. Otherwise, we, will, we can follow up as the committee um, in writing on those things. Well, uh, for it, we don't go district by district, we go by watershed. Uh, it, it, nature decides where the water is going to go. So we in the Boston Water Sewer looks at the entire city. Um, there are individuals that have portions of the drainage. Massport has a bunch that they deal with because it's their property and they own it. And, and they deal. But overall, our, our studies will be out uh, in, in the spring um, and we're furthering. We continually update our studies, et cetera, and it, it's all public information. Um, and truthfully, Steve, I forgot the other great points you made. So I think the committee can take it up later and I can get back to you on them. Okay, great. Sounds good. And then I don't know if there was anything specific on the Nubian square oh, installation. Uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, I can just jump on the Nubian. I, I think I would really need to walk along there because there's both the public Nubian stuff that we had done and there's private. And so I would really like to take a tour and see which ones are causing the problem and then we could discuss it. Great. And Kate, did you have anything to add on that? Yeah, for, for Nubian, starting with the first set of comments, and I'll jump to the second one. For Nubian, uh, if there is uh, some, if there are issues with any of the public uh, green infrastructure that John was mentioning, uh, those two new maintenance contracts that I mentioned that are part of the city's first green infrastructure policy can be deployed to do maintenance uh, in that location. Um, John is right, though. Um, currently, we're not equipped to be able to do maintenance on private property or private land. Um, so it would it would very much be focused on the anything that was in the public right of way or that was on public land. Um, but happy to um, to do whatever I can to help help in that location with maintenance um, using those contracts. And then um, responding to Steve's comments, um, actually, when when I was at Boston Water and Sewer, um, we did some sub watershed uh, tributary areas uh, studies that um, identified a couple of different uh, locations within each of three tributaries, um, the Canterbury Brook, the Lower Stony Brook, um, and the North Beacon, which is like an Alston Brighton area. Um, and, you know, the intent of the studies or the purpose of the studies was to look at um, specific areas, not districts, because as John mentioned, um, it, we typically look at things by watershed or sub-watershed, um, but to identify locations within sub-watersheds that could, uh, you know, site, be good sites for green infrastructure installations that would provide, um, you know, both water quality, but also quantity benefits to, um, to that sub-watershed and then obviously the larger watershed. Um, and those are completed um, and might be an interesting kind of reference point. Um, I think that one of the things I'd like to talk about sometime in the future um, is doing similar studies for the remaining uh, sub watersheds in the city of Boston and then acting on some of the sites or projects that were called out by these studies. Um, and that's something that we'll um, obviously be talking to Boston Water and Sewer about in the future. Um, and in terms of funding um, and a variety of other things, that's also something else that we're working on um, from the city, um, but also Boston Water and Sewer is working on this as well. Um, I know that other um, public utilities in other cities and towns have grant programs, have um, you know funds that are set aside essentially to do large uh, you know green infrastructure installations that will have positive benefits for larger watershed areas. Um, there's, uh, I want to say, Long Creek Watershed up in Maine, for example, where there's an entire, um, you know, watershed that has been identified as, as needing um, a whole lot of work. Um, and so the um, regional water and sewer utility up there has grant funds and other things that are available for all types of property owners within that watershed to do green infrastructure and a variety of other um, water quality improvement projects. Um, so I know that there's lots of different things that we can look to both domestically, but also I agree um, internationally, people are doing really interesting work around stormwater management, around green infrastructure. And that's something that um, 
you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of value in learning from what other people are doing and doing well. Um, and so I, I think that that has definitely factored into um, some of my recommendations and some of my plans looking to other domestic and international peer utilities um, and peer cities. Um, but I know that um, that's, that's something that we will continue to work with um, Boston Water and Sewer and others on um, in the future. So um, I, I think I might have missed one of your um, topics, Steve, but I think that that was most of them. Again, I'll review and um, if there's anything that I missed, we can send you some more information after the hearing. Great, thanks so much. Um, thank you to both of you and, and um, to you, Christian, and uh, uh, Chairman Vitale and the whole Boston Water and Sewer team for joining. Nayeli Rodriguez, who was with us earlier. Um, we're just, uh, we're really grateful for all of your work and everybody's testimony. Um, and if my colleagues are all okay, then um, this hearing of the, this joint hearing of the in, Environment Resiliency, no, you say it. Environmental Justice, Resiliency, and Parks. The Environmental Justice, Resiliency, and Parks Committee and the City Services and Innovation Technology Committee. Good luck getting that onto a header. <laughs> um, this uh, joint hearing is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.